We are live from Council Chamber, and before we begin, I'll go over the emergency response plan for the room. In an emergency, everyone must evacuate through the nearest safe exit. Those seated in the gallery take direction from security to evacuate. Council takes direction from the meeting clerk to evacuate. After evacuating the room, please proceed to a stairwell, take the stairs to ground level, and evacuate the building through the doors marked emergency exit and go to a muster point. Do not take an elevator or walk through the city room. Anyone with limited mobility should identify themselves to security or the meeting clerk during an evacuation. And finally, please speak with security or the meeting clerk if you require first aid. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting uh, back to order. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of TD6 territory and Métis homelands, and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory uh, for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Nakura, Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and all settlers from around the world. Uh, we'll do a roll call of council colleagues. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councilor Salvador. Good morning. Councilor Cartmel. Good morning. Councilor Rice. Good morning. And Councilor Jans. Good morning. All right, so everyone is here. And we are into our first item of the day, which is 7.2 Major Capital Project Update. We'll go to administration for a presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Craig Waldman. I'm the acting deputy city manager for Integrated Infrastructure Services. And I, along with a number of others, are happy to be here today. Before I hand over to Michelle to do the presentation, I wanted to share a few opening remarks. So the major capital projects play a key role in shaping the city's future. When we build Edmonton with purpose, we support the goals and objectives of the growth as outlined in the city plan in achieving this. And above all, we're proud of our commitment to deliver quality, safe, and vibrant infrastructure for Edmontonians. In keeping with our continuous improvement goals, administration undertook an independent review of its management and oversight of major capital projects. The report presented today affirms the quality of the work completed by the Integrated Infrastructure Services team and our collective and ongoing commitment to continuous improvement and excellence. Prior to introducing the delegation, I wanted to also highlight and acknowledge that this update today is a culmination of more than eight years of leadership of the IAS department uh, from and with Adam Lachlan, from the creation of the department to the many processes, procedures that have been developed and implemented through to this review today. Uh, I know if Adam were here, he would be saying that all of these achievements are due to all the great work and dedication of all of those around him, and that is true. However, it was Adam's leadership throughout this journey and the key role he played in leading us through this that deserves acknowledgement, so I just wanted to make sure I did that today as well. So back to the review itself. The city retained the services of the University of Alberta's Construction Innovation Centre and Stantec Consulting to complete concurrent and independent reviews. Their role and work will be covered in our presentation today. So joining our delegation today is Dr. Simon Aberis, the Dean of Faculty of Engineering at the University of Alberta, which includes the Construction Innovation Centre. Uh, the Construction Innovation Centre is one of the foremost leaders in construction management institutions in North America. Also here to answer questions from the University of Alberta is Dr. Farouk Hamza, Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering. 
We also have with us today Steve Fleck, the Chief Practice and Project Officer at Stantec Consulting Limited. He leads the governance of Stantec's largest projects while overseeing alternate project delivery for Stantec. As many of you are likely aware, Stantec is locally headquartered here and is a global design and delivery firm with comprehensive experience in leading major projects for private and public sector clients. Also with me today is Michelle, who will be presenting the, and she is our practice leader for the City of Edmonton's Project Management Center of Excellence. And we also have, have key people online to further support questions from Council. So in closing, I want to add that as part of this work, we requested reviews and input from key industry partner organizations and resulting from that we received letters of support that I believe uh, have been shared with Council through the Council correspondence and those letters came from the Edmonton Construct excuse me, Construction Association, Alberta Road Builders and Heavy Construction Association and the Consulting Engineers of Alberta organizations. Uh, we're available to answer questions following the presentation and I will hand it over to Michelle to begin the presentation now. Thank you, Craig. Um, good morning. As a result of the challenges faced by a, a P3 proponent, administration initiated an independent review of the major capital projects to assess the levels of oversight that are in place and continue to drive maturity and continuous improvement within our project management practices. Next slide. For this review, we use the definition of a major capital infrastructure project as anything or any project with an expenditure greater than $20 million or a profile that was highly strategic, complex, and include any, many stakeholders or major constraints. Next slide. Major capital projects are complex and multifaceted. With that in mind, the review comprised of a variety of topics to assess how major projects are conducted. The review looked at our governance practices, project management practices, reporting, performance trending and performance reporting, project delivery method selection, procurement approaches and current industry market trends. Next slide. Two third party in consultants were retained independently to undertake a scope of work for this review. The University of Alberta Faculty of Engineering and the Construction Innovation Centre create a focal point of academia, industry and government to come together to meet the challenges facing construction industries to create high impact innovations across the construction engineering spectrum. The U of A focused on the academic and research review. Stantec Consulting is a global design and delivery firm with experience in engineering, project management and business management for private and public sector clients. Stantec focused on local and global industry perspectives. Administration undertook a review of a, and assessment of our current performance on major projects. A number of major capital projects along with administration's policies, practices and tools were assessed through these reviews. Next slide. On average, IIS has approximately or over 200 active projects at any given time, of which usually around 35 are classified as major. Of the active major projects at the initiation of this review, 13 were selected to be representative of the diversity of our capital construction program. The selected projects meet the definition of a major capital project and are all larger than $20 million. The selected projects also differ in terms of the asset types they represent as well as the various delivery methods. On this slide we show the spectrum of risk transfer each delivery method offers as on the projects that we selected as well as the ones with early contractor involvement methods. Next slide. Before we look at um, today, it's important to recognize the efforts and the significant improvements made over the past decade to enhance delivery of infrastructure projects to Edmontonians. We're proud of our commitment to deliver quality, safe and vibrant infrastructure for Edmontonians. Next slide. In 2010, the Project Management Center of Excellence was established. That's our first project management office to support capital construction. In 2013, our administrative director directive, now a project management standard, was established asking all construction projects um, to follow consistent and standard project management practices. In 2013, we also established our project management reference guide, which is really our how-to manual for project management. In 2016, the reorganization that created IIS allowed for us to do a significant review and structuring of a role clarity of the project manager within the construction department. 
And in 2017, we adopted policy C591, the project develop and deliver model, and that was applied to all capital construction projects. Next slide. The Office of the City Auditor recommendations over time further demonstrate administration's improvements within project management space. The recommendations stemming from the 2008 23rd Avenue and Gateway Boulevard project audit found no consistent project management practices were in place. In 2014 to 2017, there were capital project advisory reviews conducted on projects within the construction arms of the, of the organization. And in 2017, those were ended because of the significant improvements in project management practices seen by the auditor. In 2018, the Waste Services Audit actually recommended the Waste Management Department adopt the PMRG, or the Project Management Reference Guide, and align to policy C591. In 2022, the Project Management um, of Transportation Infrastructure Audit highlighted that there were established effective controls to manage project budgeting, scheduling, and quality of transportation projects. This audit really bookended the 2008 audit where there were nine recommendations down to only one recommendation. And then the most recent Southeast Valley, Valley Line Southeast audit in September of 2022, which concluded that the that city's P3 procurement process was done in a fair, open, and transparent manner, and the project agreements for the Valley Line were determined to clearly allocate risks, protect the city and the taxpayers' financial interests, and set requirements for project communication. Next slide. Our journey on to improve performance reporting started in 2012 where we started quarterly reporting on our projects. We introduced the red, yellow, green traffic light system for reporting performance in 2013. In 2015, we set thresholds for performance um, reporting. In 2019, we established the Building Edmonton website where we transparently report our project performance on all capital projects to the public and to council. And in 2019, we also amended the thresholds for set um, that are set for performance reporting on, on time and on budget. Um, along, oh, sorry. Um, and again, this journey shows that we have been responsive to feedback and recommendations on our reporting and transportation since, and transparency since 2012, and have been maturing our project reporting over time. If we look at these timelines in context of major capital projects, they're, they're similar to the lengths that we experience on our projects. Next slide. Now I'll switch to reviewing the findings of today and the, re and the reviews that were recently undertaken. The findings can be summarized into three categories. The first one is validation of our project practices. Next slide. The U of A used a four-level assessment ranking scale to benchmark IIS's practices. This scale is similar to a typical maturity scale, and as such, a level three of standardized is expected or would be our goal. That is, having a well-defined and applied practice. Between interviews, policy reviews, process reviews, and project reviews, the U of A scored our practices. Next slide. The U of A review showed that our project governance practices meets or exceeds the standardized level in a variety of categories for project governance. Next slide. The independent review also showed that the project management practices meets or exceeds a standardized classification. This review also compared us to two other major capital or major Canadian cities and we were found to be comparable. Of note, one of those cities did win an award from the PMI Institute for their framework. Next slide. As seen on the last slide, procurement processes scored a rating of four. And the independent review stated, IIS undertakes a standardized, fair, and transparent approach for procuring services of consultants, contractors, and or suppliers on major capital projects. Next slide. Although Santec did not score our processes around project delivery method selection, their review indicated that our project delivery method and selection is proactive, where we're trying new models or methods as they evolve that it's tailored and scalable to the project needs and decisions are driven by project considerations, that our approach is adaptable to changing conditions and the structured review of the city's PDDM allows for progressive revalidation of the selection 
as the project progresses and or if market conditions change. Next slide. They went so far as to say our practices are aligned with current industry practices and our approach recognizes that there is not a one size fits all approach. So being fair and balanced in risk allocation is key. Next slide. The second category would be transparency. Next slide. The academic review from the U of A found that the city of Edmonton meets a high level of transparency in our project reporting when compared to five other Canadian cities. Next slide. They went on to say that the city of Edmonton has an exhaustive, timely, interactive, and easily accessible approach to transparency through our Building Edmonton website, and that it sets the standard for all cities to follow suit. Next slide. The third category would be our performance reporting. Next slide. Our cur the current performance research gives us the iron law of project management. This data is based on well-documented and highly cited research, and it tells us that the overall performance on mega projects shows that very few mega projects achieve on time and on budget. This shows that project management is not an exact science, and even with the best practices in place, risks can still occur and have impacts on our ability to deliver it shows that only 8.5% of projects are delivered on time and on budget. Next. Our performance data is the inverse of that performance. As reported in the September Capital Financial Update, our performance falls in a, in, within the acceptable tolerances for budget and for schedule and at a much higher success rate than typical. We are committed to building Edmonton on time, on budget, and with purpose. Next slide. Research continues to show that planning is an iterative manner and learning before you deliver at full scale increases your odds of delivering um, successfully. The PDDM policy C591 is designed to ensure that appropriate level of development has been completed on projects prior to delivering or transitioning them to our delivery phase. If we use project cycle times, the amount of time that we spend in each phase of the work, develop or deliver, as an indicator, we are meeting the intent of the policy and what research is telling us. And we do believe by continuing these practices, we will continue to see successful project outcomes. The independent review from Stantec also indicated that the PDDM framework allows for flexibility with multiple levels of stages of review, validation, approval throughout the project life cycle. Next slide. The independent review from the U of A also showed that our processes around performance reporting and performance metrics and engagement meet or exceed a standardized level. Next slide. The review also included insights from industry and included interviews with owners, designers, contractors, financial advisors, insurers, legal firms, as well as publicly available resources to provide industry and market trending. This portion of the review is focused on understanding the practices and processes adopted by other public sector owners and more generally current industry trends as it relates to project delivery methods. It is important to highlight that this portion of the report is not based on nor an assessment of the city's processes, projects, or representatives. Next slide. One observation from industry was that they wanted more early contractor involvement in projects. As you saw earlier in the presentation, a lot of our projects and that we reviewed included what is considered early contractor involvement methodologies. Based on current market conditions, the industry also indicated a, a decline in interest in P3 or lump sum methodologies. For our business, these are still appropriate delivery methods or tools in your toolbox um, and are applied as project conditions require. Next slide. The market insights also indicated that industry wants to be more involved in projects and involved in what makes projects successful. IIS puts considerable effort into building relationships on projects and within industry. We also conduct sound market, market sounding before entering into different approaches for major projects. This is further supported by the letters of support we received from various associations after the publication of this report. Next slide. 
The report also indicated that industry wants fair and balanced risk allocation on projects. IIS acknowledges that we cannot have full risk transfer as a municipality, but we do try to take a balanced approach while considering project specifics and needs. And selecting the appropriate and clear approaches to risk allocation that is tailored to the project requirements, we try to prevent claims and disputes. Next. The industry indicated that there is a perception that government projects have budgets established too early to be accurate and encourage public owners to make investment decisions after sufficient information or design is available. The implementation of the PDDM within the city of Edmonton and our approach to funding and making go-no-go -no -go decisions is intended to ensure this does not occur. Next. The industry also indicated they want value-based approach to procurement decisions. This is an approach IIS has already implemented with a value-based selection approach considering risk, quality, and cost metrics. In 2023, IIS had less than 10% of our procurement events as low bid, and they were based on project requirements. We utilize a combination of value-based, quality-based, and low bid as required on our projects. Next. Industry indicated assessing mega projects to be broken down into multiple projects as it might lead to better outcomes and project interest. IIS uses this approach when applicable. Yellowhead is a great example of, of us adopting this um, approach. And again, we tailor it to the approach with the project requirements in mind. Next. Industry also indicated that owners should not only act as contract administrators, but of but be informed and educated project staff to manage and execute projects. IIS does go beyond con transactional contract administration to include knowledgeable project leaders who can drive outcomes for Edmontonians. What the industry insights show is that our, our framework provides the correct foundation for project delivery and that we have the tools in place to be utilized on projects as needed to support successful outcomes. Next. As with any assessment of this type, there were recommendations for consideration on our continuous improvement journey. Next. If we think back to the beginning of the slide presentation and the journey towards project management maturity, this observation is a critical indicator of the progress that we are making towards project management excellence and in successful delivery of capital projects for Edmontonians. Having a culture of continuous improvement is critical to high performing teams and organizations. This is an indicator that we're operating as per our business model and that we're committed to being better than we were yesterday and doing the work today to be better tomorrow. Next. While IIS already follows a standardized governance and project management practice, there was six recommendations for consideration. These recommendations are refinements to our framework and not indicators of gaps or changes to our practices. They included enhancements to our gated process of the, of the project develop and deliver model, cost management, and documentation. IIS is evaluating these opportunities and where they are not already part of our continuous improvement plans, considering how they can be incorporated into our practices. Next. While the city has made great strides toward project management excellence and transparency when compared to other owners, the dollar thresholds currently being adopted for oversight and evaluations of projects is low. To strengthen alignment with industry and market conditions, the independent reviews suggested revisiting the current set thresholds for major projects. One recommendation was for considering the, the threshold or the definition of a major capital project from $20 million to $100 million. Administration at this point doesn't recommend us proceeding with this recommendation. The total number of projects that is reported under the classification of major has not changed significantly over the past number of years. However, if this number does tend to, or does increase significantly, this should be considered. Review of C555, which is our P3 policy, requires P3 screening for projects at $30 million. The recommendation is to increase that to $100 million. Review of this policy should be undertaken. This policy was created back in 2010 and has not been reviewed or updated since then. And due to market and inflationary conditions, this threshold for this policy is low. 
The third threshold um, was the recommendation was to streamline administrative reporting and approval policies processes and this would include assessing the two and five million dollar thresholds for growth and renewal profiles this approach is being considered for a specific program in the spring SCBA next slide the review can concluded that administration has established effective project management framework to deliver major capital infrastructure projects, and it is aligned with industry best practices. The external reviewers verified that the City of Edmonton's commitment to maturing project management practices, and while challenges within the project delivery are not unique, the findings highlighted that the City's adherence to comprehensive planning, risk assessment, and transparency are in place. And with that, I'll hand it back to Craig. All right, thank you, Michelle, and uh, I appreciate uh, Council's patience. I know that was a longer presentation than normal, but this was a significant amount of work that had a lot of findings, and we thought it was important to share uh, that with you. Um, for the external, the University of Alberta and Stantec representatives, we have them for around 40 to 45 minutes, then some may have to drop off for other commitments, so I thought I should uh, make you all aware of that. And with that, we're happy to take any questions. And thank you. No, actually, thank you so much for this very comprehensive uh, 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 presentation. I think it's very important, and I think it does answer a lot of questions that might be on on, on uh, counselor's uh, mind. And I just want to clarify, Michelle, uh, you, when you mentioned uh, a review of policy C55, P3 policy, you meant $500 million, not 100, right? Just want to make sure that we were we are aligned on that. It's 500 million, right? Okay. Correct. Good, yeah. good, good. Thank you so much. All right, questions. Constable Stevenson, you uh, uh, exempted this? Well, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, both for the presentation this morning and, and the report, uh, and to our, our external partners as well for the, the detail that was undertaken. Uh, you know, I think there were so many, so many positive elements that were highlighted. Just... Um, you know, maybe just as a, as a starting point, a general general um, question around some of the recommendations. So yeah, recognizing that they're not pointing to, to glaring gaps or huge concerns, but just sort of that, that continuous improvement. What, what approach will you be taking um, as a department to, to integrate those moving forward? I know we're, we've looked at some specific bylaw changes that are maybe needed, but what about those, those other recommendations? So I can begin, yeah, as Michelle said, all of the recommendations, and, and we brought an in information report today because we're, we're either already working on those or we're gonna be looking at integrating all of those elements in. Even when you look at the P3s, as we highlighted, that's a significant change. We've seen a change in the market to where we wanna go bigger scale, but it's not a burden on us administratively with the number we're reviewing or how we review them. So we should do, we do suggest we do the policy update but I wouldn't call it time critical. So we're gonna to work towards those when it looks like it's appropriate, and we'll bring the appropriate elements to you when, when we feel we should be. But we're, we're, we're working on all those elements. Great, yeah, and you know, I just think about when we do our internal auditing, we sort of have the, the recommendations and then sort of some clear, clear reporting on those. So would, so would the thought be that we would have, you know, maybe a touch point a year from now reflecting back on, on what changes have been implemented or what, what's the thought there? For sure, we could we could set up a separate update in relation to this broader goals report you saw. Like we could do an annual update how we're doing and remember we do have the quarterly reporting and we're always trying to track and show you uh, as we go too. So we can we can do more or we can modify a little bit what we currently do or both. Yeah, and I think I, think I would see that fitting really well with the quarterly updates to just have a, a section on, you know, just reflecting back again. Uh, just, just to ensure that we're we're continuing to communicate the the great work that's happening and continuing to happen. You know what what I reflect on. So I think that this report has really highlighted sort of the excellent uh, processes that have been established in administration. Uh, but of course, there's another party in in these decisions, which is council. And and the report doesn't necessarily speak to the effectiveness of our involvement or you know times at which I think um, you know different different considerations and. Uh, uh, stresses at this table um, can can um, you know maybe maybe cause inefficiencies or challenges with with the the process. So, a question that I have. Well, it's interesting. So, so section four point three of the report spoke to sort of um, some of the challenges around the affordability caps. So, when council is setting a budget, sort of maybe too early in the process. Then, then it creates this expectation that you know the budget is constantly going over. We're always exceeding it. Um, at the same time, 
I know that there have been projects in the past that we have, you know, um, allowed to go to checkpoint three, which has resulted in, in design costs, and then, and then they ultimately don't proceed forward. So maybe just as a starting point, do we have a sense of, of how much we have invested in designs for projects that haven't, haven't ultimately moved forward or have been paused for a longer period of time? Yeah, we did some cursory work on that, and I, I know we shared some of those elements out to yourself. And uh, based on what we set up for our budget uh, cycle from 23 to 26, we did some analysis, and probably in the scale of a little over 20 million, I think we were closer to 25 on that. And that was just a cursory review from from that context. Yeah, and you know, again, in context, that's twenty five million on a multi billion dollar capital budget. So, so not Correct. necessarily a huge proportion. Um, but just wondering, you know, wondering, just sort of how 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 we manage that. Because again, I think the trade off is the earlier we sort of approve a project moving to completion, the less cost certainty we have, but the longer we wait, and I think you know the report was even suggesting waiting until just before tender, but we spend a lot more on, on design. So um, I have a subsequent motion to maybe explore sort of how, just, just some more information so that we can understand how we balance those. Um, I did note though that the early contractor involvement was seen as a way to get more cost certainty earlier in the process. So could, could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Sure, yeah, I know we have our guests here too, so um, maybe I'll check um, um, if, uh, in relation to the work we did. Um, maybe I'll see if... Uh, and you know what, I'm running dangerously short on time, so... Maybe you can come back for a second and sure. ask that question yeah. again, then they gave sure. you a fulsome answer instead of 15 second answer. Uh, can you also move the recommendation for uh, receive for information? Oh yes, happy thank to. You. Yeah, so we have a motion on the floor then. We need a second. Second. Councilor Salvador, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, Constance Salvador, go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, really appreciate the report and the comprehensive presentation. Um, and it's amazing to see how far we've come since, uh, I think, 2008. And yeah, I appreciate sort of that um, overview of the evolution of uh, where we've come from as well. So uh, I think most of my questions are around, um, yeah, the project cost thresholds. And I appreciated the slide there because uh, I was going to ask the same question, you know, what what is the need or desire to go from 20 to 100? Um, and I hear that we're on recommend or on administration side, we're not recommending that, correct? Yeah. Um, and maybe just if we have uh, the folks from Stantec on, I'm just curious to hear your perspectives on that piece. I know it was included uh, as an area of opportunity. Yeah, Steve, go ahead, please. Um, yeah, we, it, it really that's uh, that was built on what we're seeing as more common definitions for major projects and 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 more common P3 screens um, uh, across uh, other uh, public sector clients. Um, the P3 screen issue has evolved over time. Um, in the 2000s, uh, it was uh, fairly commonly set at at 50 million. Um, it moved to 100 million, and now you know we're we're seeing. Um, that that move up significantly again across the the, the various jurisdictions in which we operate in, um, and uh, the same thing with the definition of of major projects from you know from the perspective that we bring um, uh, in in operating in many major jurisdictions in Canada and and around the globe, um, uh, the the twenty million dollar number is is really very low. Um, and obviously, I respect uh, uh, the administration's decision to not change that. But uh, again, um, we were asked for you know our view and, and the perspective that we could bring from uh, again seeing multiple jurisdictions. Okay, okay, I appreciate that. And could you just help me understand or walk me through some of the trade-offs then of uh, potentially increasing that or keeping it the same? Um, well, I think that uh, the trade-offs are that you know when you establish a major project, you have a certain amount of rigor um, uh, attached to it, which uh, is is sound and correct, um, but it allows uh, smaller projects to perhaps be executed um, uh, a little bit more efficiently, a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more uh, uh, unencumbered, if you will. Um, you know, with some uh, additional risk uh, that uh, comes with you know perhaps not having that rigor, but because the projects are smaller. Uh, the implications of that risk, should they occur, are 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 not that material. So that that's really 
the basis on the on the major project one and the, and and with the P3 the P3 screen um, again tends to be a fairly onerous and um, and uh, um, uh, you know fairly onerous and, and uh, uh, time consuming exercise uh, and and the P3 screen also uh, um, depends on uh, on calculations often for value for money. Um, uh, that uh, are put together and, you know, are often seen as um, being far more accurate, really, than their inputs um, deserve them to be uh, because, um, because assumptions um, can be skewed to essentially derive the answer that you, you, you want to derive. So, so our view is that, you know, when, when the projects for, um, are at significant size, um, the work can be done um, uh, more thoroughly, uh, and it, and and those uh, assumptions can be you know adequately challenged, and you you do it a um, few times, but in a lot more depth rather than many times, and perhaps not with the same rigor. Okay, I really appreciate that answer. Um, and then I'm just going to go back to back to administration. Um, I guess for the for increasing the P3 threshold in particular, uh, I know not recommending around the threshold for major capital projects, which I agree with, um, just to maintain that higher degree of rigor. Um, but yeah, thoughts on the on the increase for the P3 threshold. I guess that, how, how many projects are over 500 million, I guess? And what what, how, what would that change uh, in, in terms of uh, typology of projects, number of projects? Right, yeah, I, I think Steve really highlighted the context of it. Right now, the robustness at the 30 million would elevate itself as we increase that threshold if we went to 500 million. And as you know, there are there are probably handfuls of projects that are at that scale for the city of Edmonton. But uh, when we did undertake those, regardless when we would undertake that scale, we would do the rigor required through that review and, and process. So. Okay, um, I'm pretty much out of time, thanks. Thank you, Councilor Salvador, Councilor Carmel. Thank you, uh, I'll pick up there a little bit anyway, so. Um, I don't think you mean to imply that if a project is smaller, it gets less rigor. No, right. sorry, I should yeah. have chosen my words a bit more carefully. It's the same rigor in the process of a P3 evaluation. So, so is the change in threshold, does that mean we would not consider a P3 contract until the project was 500 million or greater? That's what that means, In right? effect, yes. Right, but P3 uh, evaluations come with a high degree of rigor. Which is, is, which doesn't mean that if a project is not a P3, it doesn't get you know some examination and, and a you know a similar sifting through. Agreed. This is specific yeah. to P3 and the evaluation of the merits of that, not how we would undertake the rigor of how we would proceed with a project. The if project. that's what you're asking. Yeah. I, well, I I have questions about that, but just in the size of project, and I you know there's a, a the third cell or the third row in that same chart suggests. Um, that a project does not become an independent project, does not, I mean, these are my words, doesn't get pulled out of the envelope and uh, right now it's at two million and five million, we might increase those thresholds, which means that projects that didn't meet a higher threshold, I'm not sure what you're thinking, five and 10, eight and 20, are you, have you got a number in mind? I don't know that we do. Steve, I don't know, do you wanna comment on that at all since that was the recommendation from the report? Well, it, it, again, um, it, what we're, you know, there is a, um, uh, so actually maybe you better just restate the question for me so that I don't end up heading in a tangent. You don't want me to. Yeah. This is where I'm, I, I, I wonder if there is an ideal range of the size of a project. So from on the one hand, if you have an envelope of my number, $50 million to deliver 10 or 12 projects. Project one is sailing off to the side because reasons, and project eight is coming in, you know, very much under budget, but on the balance, they're on, but you, you, you've got the right amount of money to manage and to deliver a set of work, whether it's one pro, you know, 12 discrete things or one discrete thing. And at the other end of the scale, does a project become almost too big to manage? And that might be different for Edmonton than it is for Toronto or for San Francisco. Right. But, it, but you know, so as an example, I think that we would have been more successful on some of our LRT projects if they weren't one project, but if they were 
a, a, you know, a, a, a number of projects put together. That's how we did the South LRT. It wasn't one project, it was three, four, five bundles of projects, and that was very successful. So, right. you know, is so, there a nice so, range, right? Yeah. yeah, so so I think that's that's actually a very uh, topical and interesting question now that I understand where you're coming from. Um, and, you know, uh, I could probably spend the rest of the time giving you a dissertation on the history of project evolution and size. Um, I won't do that, but but I will say that there have historically been swings uh, in our industry that have swung from um, packaging projects as one large project um, uh, to uh, exactly what you're speaking of, which is packaging them as a series of smaller projects and then managed by a program or project management team. In the current market, we're seeing it swing towards that um, that end of the spectrum, so packaging uh, larger projects into smaller components and then program managing um, the interfaces between them. Um, historically, um, if you go back to the 2000s and, and some of the drive in the 2000s and the 2010s towards P3 projects, it was because owners were uncomfortable um, and had some bad experiences managing the interfaces between those multiple yeah. projects within a program. Um, and that's what drove us to, uh, to large scale P3 and design builds. Um, but, but those projects also have proven to have had challenges in, in managing the interfaces, um, only not the owner, um, the ultimate you know, public sector owner managing those interfaces, but the private sector managing those interfaces. So, so the issue really is that, if you will, interface management, which is going to be challenging uh, regardless of where it sits um, inside of large P3 or in a program manage, managed multi-package approach, um, you know, taken on by, by an owner. Um, but that, that has been the issue that has, if you will, uh, flummoxed the industry, uh, you know, in my 40 years of, of being part of it. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor Cardinal. Councillor uh, Rice, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Uh Thank you very much, Anne, for this uh, really comprehensive presentation and the review work be done uh, by the team. And so I want to appreciate your work first. So I have a few questions regarding the recommendations. Um, the first question is more about the procedural question. Uh, if we received this as information and for the six recommendations uh, for continuous improvement, I actually really like this, those recommendations because that reflect our city's efforts uh, to continue build that culture of continuous improvement for the project management and contract management as well. Uh, so that means those recommendations already and the in the way and working on, so we do not need any more motions to refract those uh, recommendations. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, Councillor. We're moving forward uh, in favor of all those recommendations and integrating them into our processes. So as part we do the information, you, you move forward. Okay, that's wonderful. Uh, that's his first qu question. The second question, I would like to talk about a little bit earth value analysis. So this EVA as a cost control tools. And in the recommend, rec one of the recommendations specific talk about how we globally adapt to this tool. Then my question to the current as a review and for the current PDDA model, uh, do we already implement this as a cost control tool or we just use, use regular forecasting uh, to implement cost control for the project? So maybe I'll hand that over to uh... Dr. Abu-Risk to see if he can comment on, on the report summary on that. Good morning and, and thank you for having us. Um, yeah, the, the EVA uh, method is not uh, particularly part of the PDDM uh, process itself, but it's uh, supplementary in terms of it helps with the management of these projects. And from our um, you know, analysis, uh, the, the EVA is being used quite regularly on the major projects, at least the 13 projects that we looked at. 
uh, all had features of the EVA. Uh, you know, there could be more standardization amongst uh, those different uh, types of projects because they had different delivery methods. And when you apply that with different delivery methods, you can, uh, you know, you have to adapt uh, to them. I think the city is very well tuned with the basic delivery methods and, and all the new ones, you know, what they're working on improving them. And that's where the, um, the continuous improvement is, is coming from. Uh, but I, I think most of these projects are being done reasonably well with the EVA uh, approach being implemented because it integrates both cost and schedule in one uh, report and gives you a better idea of whether you're actually uh, yeah. on target or not. Uh, so why am I asking this question? Because the one the, one of the concerns that I heard in terms of the project management and for the city's major capital project is about the over budget. So that means the cost control and will be the big component for us to look at from project management perspective. If not all the projects use this tool, and then my question to city administration is, do we do the regularly forecasting and from uh, projects uh, financial management perspective to control our cost for the project? I would say, Councillor, the answer to that is yes. For every project, whether it's major or not, sure. all of our projects are following a similar process and we have similar cost control me measures. The, rig the, the level we get to towards the EVA is, I think, what we were speaking towards, but we put an appropriate cost control measure in for all scopes and scales of our projects. Uh, so is that quarterly forecasting or is monthly or is uh, biannually, annually? Yeah. So which, which method we're use is it quarterly forecasting? Right, so we're, we're constantly tracking our, our, our progress. Yeah. yeah, so I know and you talk about January, I just want to ask what tool we are doing the quarterly forecasting? So we do quarterly forecasting publicly and updates on building Edmonton and internally we're, we're doing a department wide monthly um, updates through our project managers and those are just updates for internal reporting versus public or external and then our project managers are actively doing that on a day-to-day -day basis okay. is what I'm trying uh, so to quarterly, quarterly one uh, public Sorry. funding information on our website yeah. is yeah. that right yeah Thank, thank you. you. Thank, right. you thank you, Councillor Rice. Can you also take the chair, please, Councillor Rice? Uh, yeah, I have the chair. Thank you. I want to dig deeper into the question that I raised and I think uh, need more uh, elaboration on is the oversight of the P3 project. Uh, and we have owner's engineer. We have our team uh, within IIS, right? Uh, and so we have two or uh, two groups uh, working together to ensure that oversight is provided. I'm still struggling to understand why we were not able to identify deficiencies earlier on, whether were there con concrete pi uh, pyres, whether they were uh, the, the electrical wires. That, uh, that, that, is, that is question on the owner's mind, which are our Edmontonians, right? It's also on, I think, council's mind is on my mind. And I don't have the answer. I, can anyone elaborate on that? Why we have, why we were not able to do that as owners of this project? Yeah, maybe I'll hand that over to uh, Bruce, who's branch manager of LRT, to yeah. see if he can provide an answer or some Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks, Craig. So, um, in, in the P3, uh, the role and the, the risk related to design and construction is handed over to uh, the design construction team. It is their engineers of record that are responsible for monitoring the construction and the compliance with their design. The city's team is responsible for providing oversight related to the contractor's overall compliance with our project agreement. So there yeah. is oversight and the city does identify non-conformances and raise them with uh, with the, in the case of Valley Line Southeast Transit, but the specifics related to the design and construction of elements like piers is that interface between the contractor and their own designer and the engineer of yeah. record. So if, if we notice something, we absolutely raise it. 
but the responsibility for ensuring compliance with that design is with that engineer of record, not with the city. Yeah, so I understand the Bruce, like, like your team, your role is to make sure that uh, the contractors living to the obligations that are in the, in the contract and you do that absolutely important work, but then what is the role of the uh, uh, owner's engineer? which is a very expensive exercise, right? We can't talk about numbers because they're private, but it's pretty expensive exercise. And if they're unable to identify deficiencies earlier on, then what is their role? What is owner's engineer's role in this? Well, well their, their role is very much like the city's role as the, as the city representative on monitoring compliance with the project agreement, whether it's technical or contractual, they are part of that role but they are not responsible for overseeing all of the activities of the contractor. Uh, there is a responsibility with the contractor and their designer to make sure that they, that the work is constructed in accordance with the design. So it's not like the city's not out there. We're in fact out there monitoring all of the work and, and identifying any issues that we raise. And that's the role of our owner's engineer as well as to monitor the, the technical progress of the work and monitor the work as it relates to our project agreement. But then if they, if, if they do monitor, then why those deficiencies were not identified earlier on? I think that's an issue between the contractor and the designer because we're not providing full-time on-site quality control. That is the responsibility of the contractor and their designers, not the city. I, I'm still not understanding, like I understand your role, absolutely. You know, you, you need to, and you do phenomenal work. So this is not about uh, uh, criticism anyway. I'm just trying to get to the, uh, to the issue that is on people's mind, that as owners, we spend a lot of money. Uh, this project was delayed by a few years. Why would, as owners, if I'm, if I'm building a house, you know, I keep in good eye as, a, as an owner, like, and we, hopefully identify if a deficiency, what is wrong earlier on, so that it's not delayed. So why a very expensive exercise, a contractor that we hire, whose role is to provide that oversight, but they're unable to identify deficiencies, and why do we have two organizations? Like, you you could do that. Like, if it's the role of the engin owner's engineers to just look at the, uh, uh, what, uh, the, uh, uh, the documents and uh, see whether the work is done according to those documents, but no, actually don't have earlier insight or uh, oversight into it. That's what I'm struggling really, Bruce, to understand that aspect. No, I, I understand, Mayor Sohi. And, and I think the, the difference is we do inspections, we have monitors out. Uh, when we see something, uh, then we identify it. But at the end of the day, we aren't in a position to catch everything that is happening on a job site because that responsibility really rests with the design builder not with the city. So we are checking, we're making sure the Project Co and their monitors are doing their detailed inspections, but we're not there to catch absolutely everything. That is the responsibility of the contractor and we've transferred that risk and that obligation to them. I'm over the time, I'll take the chair back and uh, goes to, uh, go to Councillor Tang. Yeah, maybe I'm going to uh, switch gear a little bit. Um, I guess just wanted a few things that kind of pinned for me uh, during this report, which I really appreciate the comprehensiveness and uh, learn a lot. Uh, and really glad to see, uh, I think, I think how pro progressive we are as a city in a lot of fronts. Um, and I also appreciate a lot of the, the letters of reference from, or sorry, letters of support from our partners. Um, so I just, so these are, you know, fairly large projects, but for example, community-led construction projects will not be part of the scope of this review. Correct, thank you. Um, but I guess this element, um, even through our PEDM process and even with some of these large projects around public input, public engagement, that would have been part of the review, correct? I see some nodding, yes? Yeah, okay. yeah. so yeah. our practice is yeah. the project manager. I guess public engagement. Yeah, I guess, per, I don't know if our external folks can comment on this. I'm just wondering how, on, on that particular element, uh, how do we compare uh, to not just industry standards, but other uh, jurisdiction standards? Um, 
are we doing the right amount? Are we, are, is it too much? You know, how, uh, because I think there is, you know, time resource aspect to that as well. Uh, just curious about some commentary there. I think that question could be directed to both uh, Steve from Stantec or um, the university. So if either of you want to comment, feel free. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll comment that we didn't really look at the public engagement um, side of, of the PDDM. We uh, we looked at more the, the procurement selection approach. Um, uh, so so I don't really have a, a comment on that um, at, from a report standpoint. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, if Professor. Ooh, yeah, I think there. from a you know the the desktop review of of the work we looked at at other municipalities you do a, a fairly good job with the public consultation process and on the uh, 13 projects that you've done i think it was probably uh, uh, extremely well done uh, now you, you you heard that uh, you do 200 projects a year so those 13 were uh, fairly good and compared to other municipalities i think you should be proud of what the uh, administration is doing in terms of uh, public consultation. Whether it's too much or too little, I don't know. It depends on who you ask. Uh, you know, if you ask the public, it's never going to be enough. But uh, in my opinion, and that of the team, I think you can just about what is right uh, for these projects. And uh, again, uh, the administration already commented on, on, on the work they've done on those. Great. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, and I do see some reference to, you know, some of our neighborhood renewal, alley renewal projects that does have quite intensive engagement in, in some of the letters. So I want to acknowledge that as well. Um, and then just going back to the, some of the threshold questions asked by my colleagues. Um, and I know those recommendations are based on global review of lots of different kinds of projects, private, public. Um, I guess I'm just wondering if you can be a bit granular with me. How do, how, 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 how do we compare to some other major Canadian cities like Calgary, Toronto? Um, is that, you know, 500 million for P3, is that kind of where, where they're at and how are they finding that uh, in terms of evaluation, reporting, et cetera? So Steve, maybe I'll let you take that one. Yeah, and um, I, I don't uh, have on hand the specific values um, uh, for, you know, the kind of granularity that you're looking for. So my apologies for that. Um, our, uh, uh, but the, the, the team um, here at Stantec that pulled this together um, would have taken uh, that into consideration, um, uh, particularly the Canadian context around setting these. Um, I could certainly follow up, and we could get you some additional information on that if that's uh, uh, through the through um, uh, uh, through uh, uh, our, our our contacts here and uh, and provide you with that information. Sure. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Um, you know, I think that's mostly my my questions, and uh, I'm happy to move a second round. Second. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Salvador. So please vote. Councillor Principe is a yes. Thank you, Councillor Principe. I'm a yes too. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Hamilton is a yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. So, yeah, just wanted to follow up on on the or, you know some of the ideas raised around the early contractor involvement to provide earlier cost certainty. Um, I think one of our guests was going to speak to that. Sure. Maybe I'll let Steve comment on that. Sure. Um, the uh, I, I mean, the theory, if you will, and, and, and certainly this plays out in practice, is that, you know, there is a, a collaboration between designer and contractor that, that drives an optimum outcome and, and a, the, the concept of constructability and the ability to bring constructability information early on in the design process um, uh, to ensure that the design doesn't um, uh, doesn't evolve uh, in a in a manner that is either more costly or 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 more difficult and hence costly um, mm. uh, to construct. So uh, that that collaboration happening early in the project is particularly efficient. 
um, you can imagine that when a design evolves to say a 60% uh, or 90% um, uh, completion and uh, a, a contractor um, has a look at the design and determines that uh, through either um, the, the components, the materials, the, the, the approach um, that would be required uh, that, uh, you know, that it, 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 there could be savings, it, it causes fairly significant um, uh, time uh, cost to uh, iterate the design and, uh, and the cost of iteration, iterating the design in order to to achieve that. So yeah. if we can get and that information of, early. Sorry, I'm just mindful yeah. of my time. I apologize to, yeah. to stop you there. So does that typically lead to sort of higher upfront costs to, to sort of save costs in the long runs, or is it a fairly cost neutral approach to have that early involvement in the process? Um, the, so there's there's two two aspects to this. Um, early contractor involvement is, is fairly cost neutral. Um, but but I think that early contractor involvement combined with um, uh, a, a, a more evolved design, in other words, do spend some money on design, um, drives your cost certainty. Also drives your ability to make you know the decisions that you have to make on on better costing information. Great. Well, yeah, certainly certainly a really promising practice, and and excited to to explore that further. Maybe just two last questions in my remaining time. Um, you know, the report sort of referred to, and, and I, I have to confess I wasn't fully clear on it, but, but some barriers potentially around council approval being needed for alternative delivery methods. There was, there was seemed to be some discussion about how that kind of creates risk or maybe leads to people not, not uh, moving forward. So just wanted to confirm sort of what, what barriers we may be creating or what um, changes could be made to provide more flexibility in the delivery model. Yeah, I, I assume that's more directed to us, specific to our processes, um, and I can have the university jump in if need be. I, I think um, our gated process is, to Steve's point, we look at our progress of design and getting more accurate with um, cost certainty, as Steve just said. So we have that gated process where checkpoint three is a certain level of design. As we evolve and grow around those basic gates and checkpoints, that earlier contractor involvement, we look at what scale of project, what are the risk factors, when do, we, when do we think it's more important to do that, where it gets more important either for the scale or, or to nail down not just cost but time certainty of what risk factors there are. So I know that's a little bit of a generic, but it really, and I think what we saw in the reports, our flexibility to analyze each project on those merits is part of an inherent good process. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can do, what's appropriate for the project specific, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I think I was just confused by the reference in the report that the council needs to approve the alternative delivery methods. I'm not sure that that's the case. We, we have okay. a- Okay, okay, yeah, there's no, just, okay. there's some, some wording in the report and, and maybe okay. I miss- We can take that offline and we can yeah, clarify perfect. it for you, but. And then just finally, just, you know, I noticed the, the recommendation around project managers being involved earlier in the process, which I think is really great. And can you, can you confirm that typically we have the same project manager going through design into implementation and delivery, or is there a break in the project manager continuity? Yeah, our process as a city has been support lead. So we have a lead project manager in the early phases, our planning and design phases, but we do have delivery project managers starting to get involved early. And this is just if it's an internal, our internal side only. And then that the amount of time transitions, and when we reach that, I guess generically that checkpoint three, then it would generally shift to the lead on the delivery side, but the planning design project manager is still there to carry it through. So that's our model of continuity. Interesting, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Cardinal. Thank you, so sorry for the bouncing around nature of these conversations. I wanna go back a little bit to the ideal project or program size question just a bit further. Are you, you doing further work on that to identify what those what those sizes would be? So the the thresholds for when they become standalone projects? We are, and, and thank you for asking that because I was gonna try and get back to that. Yeah. That two and five million threshold, those are our thresholds now and, and we do this with finance where we need to bring back to you standalone profiles. Right. We have set times when we can bring those to you and our process now says we need approval and you agree to those set budgets for us to proceed. So there's administrative overhead with those thresholds. 
For projects that are below those thresholds, we're doing the same processes of diligence, but that's just administratively being done. So that's, that's where we should be looking, I, and I think we had concurred at what is that appropriate level for that side of the administrative oversight. So you're reviewing the levels? We are. And, and therefore reviewing the size of the bundles or the envelopes that would right. come out of that? Right, and I'll give you, a, and just take a second here, like yeah. a good example of that is for the active transportation portfolio. We brought a report forward asking for an exemption from needing to bring many, many two discreet. million yeah. projects forward so we can just administratively get going on that broader profile. Yeah, so rather than $42 million projects, Correct. it might be four $20 million dollar projects or whatever the math is. Yeah. Yes. Um, are we going to look at a maximum size? And if we're going to look at a maximum size, is that maximum size going to be less than the P3 threshold, which eliminates P3s? Like, I think that the question needs to be looked at in tandem. We can look at the whole spectrum for yeah. sure. And remember, this would come back to you for approval before we would change the thresholds because we have our processes around them. Because I'd be interested in a $500 million dollar maximum project size. Because in, in my I view, I saying. think when we get too much bigger than that, we eliminate our local community. And I'm, I'm going to need another round because I want to talk about involvement of the local community. Okay. So I'd be interested in that. I don't know if you need a motion for that, but if you do, I can make a subsequent about examining the maximum size of, of projects. If you'd like that to be explored, probably a motion would probably be motion. good okay. so we can set context to it. All right, I'll get to work on that. Okay, so I want to shift then in the, just briefly to the conversation around risk versus oversight. So let's use the example of a roof. If I write a contract for a roof, I'm contracting a roofer to build a roof and a roofer to get that roof inspected. So as the, as the owner representative, my, my job is to make sure the roof goes on and the inspector inspects. And then if anything goes wrong with that roof, guess who gets to fix it? The roofer or the inspector or both, but not me. Correct? Correct. But the minute I say, hey, I'm the project manager and I looked at your roof, I reviewed your roof, I want to be involved in reviewing your roof, and I've done my review, and guess what? I don't like part of your roof, so I want you to replace it. Who's paying for that replacement, typically? Because it hasn't failed yet, so who owns it? I do. Right. So if we want a contractor or a subcontractor to be 100% responsible, then they need to be 100% in control, correct? Generally, yes, that's correct. And, and I'm going into my mind on contract language and things of how we control sure. those risks, yeah. but yes. Yeah, I mean, if we, well, the longer the contract, the more places that somebody's going to come and poke a hole in it and try to spread the risk. Right. Right. And we're moving, it's my understanding that as an industry, uh, par particularly on the great big projects, we're moving a lot away from the idea of 100% risk anyway. Yeah, both, all these reports show that that's the progress, not just we, but is happening in industry, industry overall. Sorry, yeah, yes. industry, yeah, 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 not just the city. So the, the review that was done by the external parties, that was essentially a desktop exercise. That was a review of policy, a review of administrative procedure, a review of, of you know, on paper what the city does in, in managing projects, yeah? Yeah, specifically related to 13 projects where they were able to look at how they went, projects that are, so it was in relation to those 13 projects. And were all those projects completed? No. no, no, they weren't they all weren't, complete. Right, Some yeah. were in process. And did we go look at projects in other cities that were completed, specific projects, or did we just compare processes? Processes, processes. within our projects where they were at for right. this scope of work. Yeah, okay. Okay, I, thank you. I'll have one more round. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal. Councillor Reyes? Uh, thank you, Mayor Solhi. I, I have similar question as Councillor Cardinal regarding uh, thresholds. So I will second that the motion, uh, Councillor Kalan, I will put up uh, for that. Um, so I want to go back to my first round question to recap uh, for the cost, uh, cost control tool. So what I heard is uh, public could check those forecasting, regular forecasting quarterly and on our city's website, but internally our city is doing monthly forecasting to ensure the cash control in place. So is that right? Recap is right? I would say generally that's correct in terms of, and, and there's two layers there. Our project managers are always, you know, actively involved in, in how we're trending in our cost controls. 
So I just wanted to reinforce that's part okay. of the roles that we have them play. But internally, we have a process where we're reviewing status of projects of others beyond just the PMs, and then we translate that to quarterly updates to, to the public on Building Edmonton, as well as updates to Council. Okay, that's great. So that is a demonstrate the great effort our city actually from project management specific for the project the financial management perspective to put the cost control on the budget for the project. So that's the first one question. The second one I would like to focus on this schedule. So I really like this reviews fundings and for our city uh, to use that iron raw and if for the project management, it demonstrates our city actually is doing well and for project management, but we still have some projects is not on schedule. So in the report, I try to find the results for the reason why it's not on the schedule. Is there any improvement methods uh, or improvement steps could uh, improve on schedule piece? Maybe I'll hand it over to Dr. Abirisk if he's still on to see if he has comments on that. I am I am still around. Um, so if I understand the question correctly, Councillor, it's uh, you want to know why projects are still um, not meeting the schedule requirements? Yes. Is that yeah? Yeah. So what's the reason and what improvement we could implement and yes. to make sure that that continues improvement? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, a great question. Uh, I think the um, uh, Steve mentioned before that uh, you know early contractor involvement is helpful from a cost perspective as well as from a scheduling perspective. Quite often, when we establish the the, the baseline for the project, a contractor could help a lot more in terms of identifying the intricate de details and uncertainties associated with that project more so than we can. And uh, getting the contractors involved early on will greatly enhance uh, that. If you look at the projects that we studied, uh, you would see that the construction management type of contracts where contractors are involved early, the schedule is the one that benefits most. You get a lot of schedule certainty in the whole uh, exercise. Of course, you're spending a little bit more money up front for that certainty, but what you can do is essentially just bring in the early contractor involvement and obviously the rigorous procedures of maintaining, um, you know, uh, the, the good uh, oversight uh, in the project and, and, and making sure that the contractor is actually following the schedule that they've given you in the first place. And the city has done a really good job with some of these projects in the past. I mean, um, the the uh, the uh, uh, some some of the iconic projects that you have, you you have uh, a lot of rigorous assessment of as built schedules that force the contractor to actually go and meet whatever they've given you before. But there's a lot of uncertainties, and I think the easiest answer is get the contractors involved early would help with the schedule. The second part is make sure that the contractor is actually doing what they're supposed to be doing by you following up with them. And that depends on the project delivery that you picked. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for that answer. And related to the last question is about the contract management, because the, uh, in Monday we talked about one thing is really related to the uh, agreements face increase to ensure contractor doing the work as per contract. So I would like to say uh, that improvement in the report. So I, I don't know if I missed anything. I couldn't say that in the report as a continuous improvement. Uh, maybe I can come back for the next round and to get some uh, information and answer and from city administration on that piece. Thank you. Thank you, Constant Rice. Can you take the chair, please? Uh, yes, I have chair. Thank you. Maybe to the folks from U of A or uh, Stantac, uh, if if we come up with uh -huh. a maximum project value threshold, say five hundred million dollars, <throat> would that allow us to? Would there be less uh, uh, less risk of uh, those projects? not being completed on time, right? Does that reduce, does the size of the project, because I think it's very valuable to explore, right? Uh, and uh, avoid problems in the future, would that help with uh, 
managing projects. So, Steve, if you're still around uh, here, I'd ask you to comment on that. Yeah. Um, so, so I think um, on the on the surface, the answer is yes. Um, you know, we've we've done um, uh, a bunch of data analytics on on project performance, and particularly project performance in that sub five hundred million dollar range. And performance does tend to be um, significantly better than than the projects over five and over a billion dollars. So that's um, you know, there's there's a number of reasons behind that. So so I, the short answer is yes, but but the, the answer may not be yes if what you're doing is taking say a $2 billion project and dividing it into four or $500 million projects. Although you may have four, um, four uh, scopes, uh, components that are, are less risky, you still have the interfaces between those scopes to manage. Mm -hmm. And the interfaces are, are actually what causes the problems, the, the budget overruns, the scope overruns on the $2 billion projects that are bid mm -hmm. as a single project. So. You know, it, it, it's. It, I, I think that um, the, you know, it it, it is um, uh, true that uh, that a, a project, say under five hundred, or particularly in the one to two hundred million dollar range, is more likely to come in on budget and on schedule. And again, based on the data analytics that we've done generally, um, if you have larger projects or programs you're trying to implement, you still have to come up with a way to manage those interfaces effectively. Got it. Any any thoughts from uh, folks from U of A? I uh, I, I kind of agree with uh, Steve uh, on on the studies like uh, that that show a lot of the uh, projects which are smaller in nature uh, tend to you know be managed better. But uh, I think it was uh, Councillor Cartnell that mentioned uh, some of that before. You can't do this without investing significantly yourself in terms of the interface management. It becomes quite a bit of a the contractual side of it. And the um, you you were buying certain risks at the expense of the, you know uh, selling some others. Uh, so when you divide the project into these pieces, uh, you better invest significantly in the uh, engineering design and the contract uh, you know aspects of it and the oversight from a contractual perspective. Otherwise, you will inherit a lot more risks and and the schedule would be blown regardless because you can get three of them done and the fourth one is not ready mm. and your project is not there, right? So, uh, you know, I, uh, the, the only other thing I would um, add to that, uh, Mr. Mayor, is that uh, the uh, construction research, the, the, uh, the transportation research board in the U.S. Uh, is, is a quite a, done quite a bit of studies and have best practices in terms of how you select the uh, approach for, uh, you know, uh, project delivery. Uh, what is the best approach in all this? And I've seen it applied in uh, some projects within the city. Uh, so th those things are there and they could be added to some of the improvements that you have to help you with that if you want something in addition to the project cost. Okay, thank you. Just want to shift quickly in my last minute. Do we apply, do we do the uh, uh, PDDF analysis on every project or a certain size project of a threshold? We do them on all of our projects, and I think Councilor Tang highlighted, except if it's community-led, because it's okay. the community leading. But okay. for all of our projects, we follow the PDD. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Good. Thank you so much. I will. Uh, I'll move the sec uh, additional round. Second. Thank you, and please vote. Councilor Principe is a yes. Thank you, Councilor Principe. Councillor Paquette, we have all the votes. Please disappear the votes. That is carried. Return the chair to you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Councillor Rice. Uh, Councillor Cartmel, go ahead, please. Great, thank you. Uh, appreciate your indulgence. So just on the point of um, collaborative project management methods and things like that, at what point do we um, bring the design team or the like the contracting team into a contract or into a project. So I know, for example, at the Expo Center, that's all about internal systems. So they were on pretty quick. And, and I'm hearing that that is going extremely well from those that are involved, just through my contacts. But is it the same for a standalone new major building 
as an example, uh, is, and my question is, is uh, what I'm driving at is uh, the built form of the project, uh, the uh, aesthetic considerations of the project, the fit and finishes that are employed in that project. At what point does the design team get involved or, uh, and, a, and how much is already baked in when they do get involved? Right, and, and as we heard and saw in the research, we're evolving um, that we're, we're too trending towards more contractor involvement. So beyond just the design team, it's contractors so we can get perspective yes, of sorry. when your product is finished, right. how is the balance, not just the, the capital side, but even the operations maintenance. So I would say we're on, we're on a progress towards those, um, all of those influences with that earlier contract involvement. Is that where you were going? Well, so, and I don't want to, I'm reluctant to pick on any one building and mm -hmm. pick on any, any you know, past project, because right. I know this is evolving and we're trying to get better, and the industry is evolving as well. So, you know, with that said, I, there are some buildings where I don't think the built form matches the function of the building, and the design is more about the form than it is about the function. Right. And that has, that has cost legacy, that has maintenance legacy, that has operations legacies, uh, that are going to cost us money forever. And, and that concerns me but I'm, I'm concerned that, that, that those decisions were made before uh, the designer and the contractor get involved. Uh, you know, you're, you, it's a, a building op square and it's round, but it's too late. Figure out how to run your pipes through this round building uh, because we're not going back to a square one. Are, is that what we do or are we getting earlier than no, that? No, we're, we're, we're growing and getting earlier and earlier and more inclusive involvement for those better outcomes. So is industry, like we're trending yeah. it beyond our city, but we are as well. And I would say there's always a bit of balance and tension for the form and what you want to present as a city, like that design element, you want to have some there, but you want to have it reasonable and sustainable too. So right. if that's where you're going, I understand the theme, and we're always looking to strike that tension or balance between the two. Are we looking at prototype buildings at all? So go design the next fire hall, but build five of them, economy of scale stuff? We're, we're not uh, from that particular perspective because every site, every condition is a little bit different. But I would say on the other side of that, every building that we do build, like our first net zero, our second one, we're going to learn from the first. But that doesn't mean that we have it's a little bit, to have a standard template that you can just use again and again, we're always using what we've learned from the past project, but each project is different enough that you want to take that independent review and design it for what it is. But, and, and I don't think that that creates a lot of burden of extra cost as I part do. of the process. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. So, I mean, you know, I've, 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 to some degree, right, the, the shape and size of a building, you know, a, a, a three-bay fire hall is a three-bay fire hall. Yes, the one we just built is net zero, so it's got a big sloping roof. Um, and we're learning from that, and a sub-question to that is we've, we're, we have moved from net zero to net zero emissions as our standard, correct? I believe so, yes. I'll okay, have to check and confirm check just to make sure we get that correct, but yes. But uh, sure, every site is different, but on the other hand, uh, we create a district park in every new area structure plan that is that considers what the size of the buildings that go into the plan are supposed to be. It's generally enough for a high school and a high school and a rec center and a fire hall. Right. So can we not get into some prototyping? Um, do you need a... And depending how you define... <laughs> I don't know that we need a motion on that, but we're happy to continue the conversation. Like elements of how we would put an artificial turf in or where we do irrigation. We, th those are pretty standard and we apply yeah. those everywhere. So I guess it depends how we define that. Well, you, you know, I, if, if we talk about small scale recreation centers, I'd love us to design, you know, a swimming pool with a fitness center in a community room. Um, and, you know, regardless of the mechanical and electrical systems, that's our design for the next 10. Right. Understood. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. I know uh, I I like Councillor Cardinal's questions. Lots of engineer related uh, knowledge there. Um, so I, I want to go back uh, 
the policy review level and uh, specific talk about the contract management. So that is what I heard most and uh, from uh, Edmontonians and the, how we can ensure those contract management to really support our city's major projects on budgets, on schedule, and then also uh, deliver it on the scope and as planned. Um, so I asked this question earlier about, yes, we mentioned about agreement, agreements, incre incre increased agreement fees could uh, hold the accountable and for contractors to do the work as per contract. But I would like to have more information. Is there any other type of sense we could really improve that uh, from contract management perspective? How that contributes to our city's major project to make sure that um, ideal outcome, like on budget, on schedule, and delivery on scope and in place. So I would like to have a little bit more information to help the public to understand this. I'll try to give some context to that. I think um, the study we undertook is that continual um, improve, continuous improvement lens that we wanted. We wanted that outside look at this time to see and get some advice and thoughts bigger than just our city. And, and what we heard from both of those reports is that we should always be looking for that risk balance with industry to bring that better service to the citizens of Edmonton. And that I'm giving a global answer, but at a broader scale, what we, what we reviewed, what we learned about what we're doing well, but more importantly, where we can continue to improve for that very service is exactly what we're presenting today. And that's our commitment to you today as well. Uh, yes, I under that, understand that commitment and is in front of us today. And then we also talk about the collaborate, collaborate relationships and between the partners and in the project management. And we also mentioned about the specific tangible approach to do this. But I still think, is there any more we could do that? Because this is a key point and really as a cost and for our city's major project, not on budget, not on time. And sometimes even we have to change the scope. I know there are many, many external factors, but I just looking for more information, more tangible approach we could implement, not this just a generic and like say, oh, we, we improve the uh, collaborate relationships. Uh, of course, that is important. So I just try to deep dig on that. Understood. Maybe that's, we'd be happy to take that offline to get a bit more detail of what you're looking for if, if that works for you to, to explore that. Um, tough, tough in the time we have here to, I need a little bit more clarity on what exactly you're looking for to, to provide an, an answer. Uh, so we, uh, I heard earlier, we still have time and when you come back for this, that threshold approval. So when is that time I for are to revisit that. So maybe from now to there, and then I would like to touch base with you to really looking for some deeper information and also solutions for this piece. Sure, yeah, we haven't set an exact time to come back. They're, they weren't immediate items, but they were commitments to move forward and bring them back for you. We may have some other subsequent motions that would drive some of those elements too. Okay, okay, thank you. That's my question. I yield my time and yeah. back to you. Mayor Sophie. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Can you take the chair? Please have just a few yeah, questions. Yeah, I have this chair. So at what stage during the PDDM process we get the industry involved? Like at once we done stage four, then we uh, tender, right? And that's, that's when the industry get involved. No, it depends on the method we use for, okay. for construction management. We're getting contractors involved earlier as part of the process. When we go to an IPD model, which was the expo, it's almost right from the start that we're bringing okay. that team together. So it, it varies by mm -hmm. scale and complexity of project as part of that risk management that we do. Got it. Yeah. Have we, for example, you know, once you've done community consultation on a project, you understand the scope, what community's expectations are, council, gives approval, okay, this is a project that we want to fund, maybe at that first first stage is completed, at the second stage of PDM, maybe why do we need to do two, three, four stages when we can just go to the industry and say, you know, this is the budget, right. this is community expectation, 
you build it. You right. design it further, you do that, whatever needs to be done, you do it. Right. So whatever model you use in how early you involve contractors, or if we feel for the, the risk and the scale of a project, we have the expertise to scope it well, mm -hmm. it's always an evolution from the concept, very cursory line for a road, a line on, on the drawing, mm -hmm. to understanding what, what we want to try and build. So really scoping out within that line what we're going to do. Are we going to have a shared use path, change the road, to the details of what's out in the field on the road, so get an understanding of the scope and scale to make those changes. So I'm trying to give an example here. Mm. That's the evolution and the progress of more refined design from a concept to a prelim to a tender ready or knowing everything we need to, to be comfortable with the scope and scale of the cost to do the work. So whatever form we take, that's the fundamentals of our project development and delivery model yeah. to have that right accuracy before we bring a request for budget and a time to mm. reduce the risk of proceeding with the project. Okay. Right. And I went right back. Does no, that help give context? No, I, I, I'll follow off line as sure. well, because I, I want to understand that more more deeply. This is, uh, can't do that in five minutes more. We we'll have that conversation. Just last remaining question over to the LRT folks. Uh, uh, you know, I think you've done an exceptional job in protecting cities' financial interests, and you build in panel, I'm talking about the Valley Nine now, right? Uh, you build in penalties and everything, but I think where I am frustrated, and a lot of Edmontonians are frustrated, we still had to wait two and a half years for the project to be completed. Any lessons learned from this exercise uh, that would help us do better on the, on the schedule uh, management? I think Mayor Sohi, uh, Bruce Ferguson here, we're always looking at lessons learned and that's part of our continuous improvement and we're always applying those to our next projects. So uh, we had lots of lessons learned uh, from Valley Line Southeast, for example, that we incorporated into the contract in Valley Line West mm -hmm. uh, to help improve uh, the potential for outcomes or where we've had issues or challenges, see if there's a way to address them uh, further in advance. So I think we're always learning on that. Uh, but at the end of the day, we also still need our contractors to build the project uh, in accordance with the schedule. And when we encounter things that we don't expect to encounter, uh, then we know that sometimes that's going to be a project delay. But we do the best we can to control the things that we can and to incentivize our contractors uh, to complete the project on schedule. But uh, as the literature and the research shows and our own experience shows, uh, that, uh, that doesn't happen on every single project. Yeah, uh, I understand. I think we are also industry leaders, right? And in, in, uh, I think you guys do a phenomenal job managing projects. So I think there's always, um, uh, you know, you, I always, I know you always strive for better ways of doing things. So I'm not, I'm, and I, I'm appreciative of that uh, as well. So if I'm asking these kind of hard questions, it's not to uh, undermine that work or not appreciate that work. Absolutely do that, but it's still something that I, I'm still not unable to give a satisfactory answer to my constituents around why we were not able to detect those defaults earlier. And I understand this, uh, the, uh, the obligations of the contract, I'm just still flagging that out for you. Thank you so much, appreciate that. Uh, I will take the chair back and go to Councilor Rutherford. We truly share. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I just really appreciated all the questions from my colleagues in this great discussion. Um, I just wanted to ask a question that I don't think has come up in the, the discussion of the PDDM. How does it help with being ready for funding from other orders of government? Can you speak a bit to that? Yeah, thank you for the question, Councillor Rutherford. So I know early on, Councillor Stevenson asked around um, the scale of where we would plan a project and then leave it. Part of the projects that we will intentionally bring forward for approval to just do those phases were ones where there may be opportunity for other levels of government funding and we need to show readiness. So part of that and why we would take that step and maybe it sits on the shelf for a while for that timing is specifically for that purpose. So we're intentional with, with that to be prepared as we work with our intergov people and what we learn from all of you of what might be coming from us for other levels of government funding so we can leverage and maximize that, so. Yeah, okay, that's that's just something I think is an important piece of this context too, right? That 
I really worry we we might be missing in this conversation. And another thing I want to highlight is is just again how long range some of these projects are, the time horizon on some of these capital projects, right? Um, because when was the PDDM model implemented? So we're still dealing with residual projects that didn't actually go through PDDM. We are there's some long running projects. 2017 is when we began, and we've been evolving it and and um, on what we bring to you and the the red, yellow, green, and so on. But 2017 yeah. is when we started. Yes. So a good example of a project that has a major project that has started and continued with the PDDM model would be the Yellowhead Trail Freeway Conversion Program. Is that correct? Yes, I would say that's correct. It's right on the fringe, so I, the majority of it and our evolution into it for our development phases, for sure. And can you give me just like, again, like when you look at that project, how are we doing on budget, on time? Have, have we, you know, the original budget? Um, yeah, just can you give me some sense of like, because I feel like that's a fair one to compare and contrast when we're talking about the PDDM model, right? Um, in a major capital project. Right, yeah, so we are still within our budget and remember we took a program approach to that and Yellowhead Trail was broken into pieces. So we've been able to uh, work with that broader program contingency and we're still within the budget and we're still trending that way. Yeah, I agree. I think Councillor Cartmel has a really good point and, and as somebody that personally worked a bit on that project, I think that that programmed approach um, has, been, has been really, really valuable. And I think the other unique piece is that it, it is um, really, it is city city led in terms of a, a team that yes, you have contractors and consultants, but the, there's a the team the accountability for that project stops and starts with the city. That's correct. We have a city team having oversight of that. Yeah. Okay. So I think I just want to provide. I just felt like that was an important example to provide some context. And I think we we see some of these really bad examples, and I think there has been a bad rep and a, a, and but that we have done a lot already to improve our project management stiff. Can we do more? Can I, you know, I think that that programmatic response from the Yellowhead is a really good example of that. Just, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I guess the question is, um, do we, given the long range of this, is it, is there a risk in starting to change things too drastically around the PDDM model? at this stage without having like not giving it the lag time indicators to see if it's actually improving situations. Right. And, and I would say the review we just had done has every indication has been that we should continue to use it and continue to evolve the model, not fundamentally change our processes. If that answers okay. the question. Yes, that, 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 that's perfect. Um, a great, great conversation today. Great report. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. So that concludes the questions. We, we have a motion on the floor to receive this for information. Uh, so anyone to speak to this, then we'll go to subsequent. Uh, Councillor Nack, go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, Mayor Soki. Um, wanted to, I didn't have any questions. Uh, really appreciated uh, the, the detailed reports and the external analysis. Um, part of why I wanted to just sort of chime in is, is um, I think what I see from these reports and how I interpret them is, is very much in line with the audit that was done uh, about two years ago. Now, I think we had the audit on the updated project management audit back in March 2022. And that audit was done to evaluate the changes that have been underway really since 2015. Uh, there have been a number of changes, and I know uh, Mr. Walbaum gave credit to, to Mr. Laughlin, who, uh, and, I, and I think it is really important to, to give, give him credit, as well as the entire team within the Integrated Infrastructure Services, because what we have seen from 2015 is a series of uh, good changes to how the city manages projects, and that has generally resulted in in good performance. Again, that doesn't mean, and, and we saw it in the presentation, we saw it in the reports, you're not going to be perfect on any project. The question is, have you built a process in place to try to minimize the risk when something doesn't go according to plan? 
Uh, and, and so I think it's a testament to the work done by city staff over the last close to a decade now to really dig into this, refine this, work on this, and create a system that seems to be uh, quite strong, including based off the external analysis. Again, I don't want anyone to suggest that we're, I'm saying we're perfect, we should never try anything else, we should never do anything more. Uh, the reports themselves show that there should be some continued work and, and I think there's gonna be some good motions, uh, subsequent motions that I think we should explore to continue to work on this. But I, I think, you know, and and I don't know if we'll ever be able to do it, but if I rewind back to 10 years ago when uh, the commentary was uh, every city project is behind schedule and over budget, um, I will say 10 years later, unfortunately, that 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 still often is raised, but it's actually not accurate <laughs> and it hasn't been accurate for a long time. Um, so I, I think it's good that we have these reports. I'm sure, and not a shot at <laughs> media, I, I'm sure this won't get covered <laughs> as, a, as a good news story. So I think we just need to continue to shout it to the rooftop, show people what has changed over the years from the reporting to council to the actual creation of the department in the first place, to the introduction of the PDDM model. Um, there's been a lot of positive steps, still more work. We're gonna keep going. But I, I just, I want everyone who has been working on this within the city for the last 10 years to, to look at this report as, as yet again, another uh, report that shows that the work they've been doing has been really valuable, has made a big difference. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm, con I'm very happy with where things have gone. If you, if you were to go back to where we were 10 years ago and look where we are today, uh, we are light years ahead of where we were. And I think in a lot of ways doing doing much better than most cities, particularly on the public reporting side of things. I, I really don't see much uh, else happening in that. And uh, and so I'm just, I, I'm really excited about this. I appreciate all the work. I'm excited to continue to see uh, folks working on this and looking forward to supporting the subsequent. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Now, Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to speak once. I do have a subsequent, but I'm not going to, uh, I'll just take this opportunity. So consider this a, a bundling of my speaking to an introduction as well. Um, this is, this is really great work. And I, you know, kind of reiterating what Councillor Knack uh, just said and illustrating with a couple of examples, uh, you know, and first of all, I, I uh, also appreciate giving props to Adam about all of this work. He led this work. He's put a lot of this stuff in place and we all benefit from it. Uh, you know, the, 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 in the before time, uh, and this goes back, I'm talking about Rabbit Hill Road, and this goes back to the days before developers were responsible for building out the roads at certain thresholds. We were left with that road to twin. Uh, and it was, it's absolutely vital. It's necessary. You know, 40,000 people use that road every day. It needs to be, it needed to be twinned. And my predecessor uh, was able to get that project approved and funded but no one had put pen to paper before then. So one of the first tasks I had was to try to move it to construction and there was not nearly enough money. It was before the PDDM model. And so administration uh, uh, you know, did what they could to cobble together dollars from this thing and that thing. So the road is there. We're missing a couple of sidewalks though, which is that ongoing legacy. And we've, we've talked about the missing sidewalk you know, problem we have across the city. And, and so while, we all in that corner of the city truly appreciate administration's effort to get that road built and twinned. It wasn't perfect. And you know, in, in, you know, compare that now to some of the projects, all of the projects that we're doing now where we do not run into that problem. We, are, we have the ability to contemplate what we're building and what we're budgeting for with not a lot of error. And I, that's a real, um, that's a really a fantastic change. And that is uh, again, you know, largely, not, not entirely, but largely to Mr. Lachlan's efforts on that. So uh, that's really worth acknowledging. Uh, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna bring forward that subsequent about uh, maximum project size. Uh, the Yellowhead, I think, is a perfect example. Uh, the South LRT is another example. And, you know, with full respect to Dr. Aberisk and Mr. Fleck's conversations and, and uh, advice that it is, the devil is in the details of the interface. Absolutely, but I think that there, with concentration on that, we we 
keep the projects to a, a small enough size that they're easier to contemplate. And that we actually involve our local contracting teams to a greater degree than we do now. I can tell you that, you know, I, I had the privilege of being on the Expo project when it was originally built when I was working at Northlands. And now I'm talking to some of those people that are actually augmenting the old part of the Expo Centre and bringing that part up to standard. But I'm talking to them in the coffee shop in my neighbourhood or when they're over for dinner or when we go to a hockey game. I, you know, it is not somebody that, that landed here from Florida to deliver a $2 billion P3 that's gone again. And that's, that is particularly important that we have people from our community building our community. And I, I, I worry that when the projects get too big, they don't get the opportunity. And at the same time, as Mr. Lachman said, sometimes we get the B team or the C team from that giant, uh, you know, consortium that's coming here to deliver it, but, you know, is not necessarily as invested in making sure that it's the perfect project. And, you know, I know that sounds a little bit like casting aspersions, but when you're, when you're sitting next to the person that is delivering the project down the street, that has value. And I want to try to do what we can to enhance value. But on all of the considerations and on all of the, you know, the pros and cons, when if that motion passes and we get something back, it's not a good idea, happy to hear that too. And maybe it's, maybe it's discreetly on a different project. Maybe there are projects over a certain threshold that should be all in one. And maybe there are some that are under a certain, a certain threshold that should be broken up into parts. So, you know, maybe that's the way we go and I'm open to that. We have work to do on built form. We have work to do on fit and finish. We have work to do on how much money we spend uh, on the materials that we procure. And uh, we need to remember the life cycle costing theory that when we put a really, really expensive piece of tile on the wall, that we are replacing it with a really, really expensive piece of tile every 10 or 15 years. Uh, you know, if, if, if the building form is not functional, and I don't want to turn everything into a concrete cube, that's not what I'm talking about, but, it's, but there's got to be a balance there. And I think that the balance has tipped too far into form and farther away from function. And I, I, um, uh, I don't think it's very far away, but I think we need to uh, really examine that. So really good report here, really good work, and uh, looking forward to continuing the work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Maybe that uh, perfect balance of form and function can be found in the, uh, the new Stanley Milner Library design. But, uh, <laughs> I joke, but, um, Still a sore spot for the city, I think. And uh, I just want to say that uh, this is really excellent work. I think that Councillor Knack and Councillor Carmel really encapsulate a lot of my own thoughts. So I won't uh, uh, move too far in that direction. But I do want to, uh, um, I'm probably going to have to bounce out of the meeting pretty quick here. So I hope that Councillor Carmel subsequent gets support. Um, this That would be really good for uh, local businesses, local contractors, and uh, especially uh, in our efforts to forward social and local uh, procurement. So it's a no brainer in my opinion. But as far as uh, uh, the rest of the work goes, we're not going to see a headline that says things have improved and continue to improve iteratively. That's probably not the attention grabbing headline media wants, but uh, that is the truth of this. And uh, that speaks to the work of so many people and uh, I'm really grateful to uh, city administration for taking those audit recommendations uh, seriously and doing the great work on it. I just wanna thank our guests who came uh, to share their wisdom and experience and knowledge with us. And uh, you know, just, Ms. Mary, you've asked really excellent questions about uh, accountability and oversight. And uh, there's also been some good uh, responses about like, what do we actually want to write into a contract and what do we want to be responsible for versus legally offloading some of those responses onto the people who are actually building the thing. So that's still a debate and a question to be had. Either way, they still would have found a big block of concrete uh, mysteriously in the North Saskatchewan River. So hard to say. But uh, yeah, with all that in mind, Again, just deep and sincere thanks to uh, members of administration, both past and present, who engaged in this work and uh, really making the city better and better and better every single day. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Rice, can you take the chair, please? 
Councillor Rice, can you take the chair, please? Uh, yes, I have the chair. Thank you. I think when we approved, when then when we got elected, we did our budget adjustment for 2021 capital. Andre, you came up with very, I would say, I, I found that data to be pretty, pretty impressive that we actually said, okay, this much investment will create this many jobs in the local community, right? I think we need to kind of highlight, continue to highlight that uh, in the significant investments that we're making in infrastructure. So just to uh, something to uh, uh, look into, because this, this is a remarkable story. Like we have 218 projects that we are funding, and it would also be very good to know like how many local businesses are benefiting from uh, uh, those 218 projects, because local, local dollars should go to local businesses for them to be prosperous and, uh, and, and creating jobs here in the, in the community. So I look forward to Councilor Cartmel's uh, uh, subsequent effect. I think that will further allow us to further explore, explore that. Uh, you know, 218 projects, 94% are on budget, which is pretty remarkable, right? So need to be congratulated. So to administration, big, big congratulations on that. 77% are on schedule, you know, again, Pretty, pretty significant uh, uh, large number of projects. Can we do better? Absolutely. I think you do better, and you always strive to do, uh, to do better. So, uh, uh, you know, I wanna, wanna appreciate that. Uh, would streamlining design help? Absolutely. I think in the last omnibus budget that we approved, we actually uh, had a motion part of that where two fire halls will follow the same design and that will save us close to $1.5 million in the, in the design. I think there's great ways of looking at uh, uh, and improving those, uh, those, those way of doing, doing things, right? So uh, really appreciate of this, uh, this report, right? My only concern and which is again, I, and this is not related to how we manage projects. I think it's more related to a, a P3 model. I think P3 model allows, um, yes, we've done a very good job protecting our financial interests, right? I think maybe we need to accept the fact that we, when we do P3, that we will lose some control over projects and, uh, and that we've transferred that risk to, uh, 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 to the contractor and there will always be some un unpredictable uh, situations such as finding a big concrete slab in the Saskatchewan River, right? Absolutely. You can't blame anyone for that. But not having, but I don't think that would have been the case in other situations. Like we should have been able to at least get a sense that why peers were not being built to the standard that they were specified to be built, right? Why the wires, electrical wires, were not, maybe they were built to standard, why, what happened, right? I think there's still outstanding questions that are on Edmontonians' minds that uh, I still don't have the answers to, uh, uh, but that's related to the one specific project. That does not mean that we don't do a good job on other projects. I want to acknowledge that. I really want to separate that. I really want you to know that I'm not questioning anything else other than that particular project that uh, is still on people's mind. I'm glad it's running, it's running perfectly fine and uh, uh, I wanna take that away either, right? But I, there's still outstanding questions that we maybe, maybe scaling down the size of the project will answer some of those questions uh, 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 in, the, in the future or maybe we need to have more rigorous process when we develop those P3 projects, right? How we hold how do you bring that transparency into a, into a, uh, so that Edmontonians can know what had happened? So that, that's the only caution I wanna flag, but again, great work. Thank you so much to, uh, to everyone. Uh, uh, with that, I'll go to Councillor Stevenson to close. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you for all the discussion today and for the great work uh, that happens ev each and every day um, and that we got to see in this report. Uh, you know, I think the, the review that was done shows very clearly, you know, the exceptional process that's been put in place and the great work and culture that's being created around continuous improvement. I think, you know, that's that's really on, you know, the admin side and, and a huge props to, to admin for that work. Um, you know, I continue to reflect on how 
council uh, plays a role in this process as well and what we can do to improve our decision making or ensure that our decision making can strengthen and complement the work that's happening in administration. So um, similar to Councillor Cartmel, I do have a, a subsequent that I'll just speak to briefly now. Um, and it's just really looking to, to start to uh, confirm the right time for council to be providing our, our budget approvals. Um, I think there's an opportunity to get some preliminary information to just understand um, understand our current state. It may be that we come back with some really excellent information about uh, seeing that there is really strong alignment in terms of the budget certainty we get at checkpoint three and that that, that is sort of a, a good process to continue. Or it may highlight uh, opportunities um, to, to think about again when council, when our role can be most effective and most supportive of the, the great process that's been set up. Um, so with that, again, thank you to, to everyone who's involved with this and look forward to receiving for information. Thank you. So please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Uh, Councillor Cartmill, you're subsequent ready? I believe so. Yeah. Pardon me? I believe so. Uh, there you go. Both the clerk and uh, admin have seen it. Okay, this is going to, I think Councillor Rice wanted to second this, right? I believe she did, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I will move that administration provide a report including a review and potential recommendations for a maximum capital project and or program size as measured by budget. Uh, and as said er earlier, uh, might be a good idea, might not, might be discrete per project, but yeah. happy to hear okay. what Edmonds has to say on that. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Uh, second by Councillor Rice. So please, uh, any any other one, uh, s someone to speak? Anyone to speak? Seeing none, to vote? Okay, please vote. Sorry, sorry. Oops, sorry. Pause. Sorry. Oh, Councillor, um, is that Councillor Rutherford? Yes, oh. I just, this is the first time I've seen the motion, and I just... I, can I just see the motion again for a second? I might just have a minor edit. There you go. Sorry, I apologize. No and I didn't have a chance to click in. It was just so quick. Uh, can we add, is there any, I guess, to the mover, would you be interested in, um, you know, thinking about the yellow head is a bit different than what you're contemplating here in this motion about the maximum capital project or program size. Um, the, the whole program at the Yellowhead was, you know, 1 billion and then it was broken down into subsequent parts, but it was all approved at once. So do you, how do you think that this motion reflects that? So uh, happy to take advice from admin on vernacular, but by program, I mean uh, the Yellowhead started as a program. Or, well, it started as a, a line item yeah. Uh, that could be defined as a program. And then as, as the program evolved, pieces were broken out into discrete projects. Um, so, uh, but there's also the conversation around the, um, around when it, when a project leaves a program and because it's own project. So for instance, we've got our Chillier Road renewal that is a program and you know, when the projects get big enough, they become a project and we're talking about changing the thresholds of those um, a $500 million program on Ontario roads would be a very big program and perhaps not discrete enough. So, uh, so by program, I'm thinking more of those somewhat standard project envelopes as opposed to a, a Yellowhead Freeway or a South LRT. Yeah, from admin side, I, I think that's understood in, in the wording here and okay. the intent of what we bring back. Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to clarify. I wanted to just clarify that. Thank you. Sorry for stopping the vote. Thank appreciate you, the appreciate the mover bringing this forward. Uh, Councillor Tang, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess just want some clarification on the due date for for the capital budget adjustment. Um, I guess are you potentially seeing some budgetary impact for this year to the mover, and then potentially follow up with them in? No, I don't see anything this year. I don't think there's anything any new giant project coming um, other than the transit garage but that's that's already on the books right so i would agree i don't think this is time specific to have no. to be tied to that 
That's oh, a good okay. Flag. So I guess I was just curious. I think why. the next big thing might be Northwest LRT. Okay. Right, and so before we. I see. Okay. Well, no, this this is coming back at Spring Capital, but I don't think this is a giant piece of work either. Not to speak for you, Mr. Wald. But yeah, I, I, can anyone guide me with when that would be, Stacy? Do you know when that, what date that would be? So I think if you're coming back in the spring SCBA, that's late. It is Early, June 11th. Mid to late May. It's June 11th, 2024, I believe. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my team might be cringing a bit, but I think for what you're asking, that's reasonable time for us to bring a report back, at least to have the conversation. Yeah, and, and yeah. sort of a pros and cons, right? What the impacts might be. And then, I, and so I guess I, the, the idea is that we'll have this information by May or June to inform some of the those major capital project decisions that might come to the table at that time. Well, I'm thinking it starts the thinking, like if, uh, you know, I, I want to be a little bit careful. Let's say, you know, that someone shook the money tree and other levels of government were going to fund, you know, the next leg of the LRT, which would present a monumental problem for us, by the way. But let's say they did. Uh, you know, okay, so should we use the South LRT model, right? Track and controls is one contract. The bridge is a second. A few stations is a third. A few more stations is a fourth. Or is it going to be all one big giant P3? I think this sort of sets up, uh, it sets up the conversation at least with a bit of an underpinning of if we do it this way, we get this. If we do it this way, we get that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I think just, I, I guess I wasn't quite anticipating having this information for some of the decision making for this year, but I, I appreciate that rationale. I don't think it impacts anything. In, in okay, general. so, yeah. and then if I mean, it's good with that, that, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay, all right. Thank you, Councillor Tang. I uh, see no more questions, so let's vote, please. You have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I just have a, a subsequent that administration provide a report containing analysis of projects completed since 2019 that have proceeded through the project development and delivery model and specifically compare the budget estimates at checkpoint three to final project costs. That would be due May 23rd, 2024 at executive committee. Need a seconder? Second. Second. Councillor Salvador. Okay. Uh, all right. Can you please make the introduction, Councillor Stevenson? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. I think, you know, um, the, the PDDM model, I think, really accounts for a lot of, uh, you know, project manage management procedures. Um, as we've seen, you know, very good practice, best practice um, compared to industry. Uh, but, but, of course, at the city, we have a really unique mechanism or part of the decision-making process and capital delivery process, which is uh, City Council. I've been reflecting on, um, you know, the impact of our decision-making and the fact that we, we are also under different pressures and different considerations at various points in a project schedule. So just reflecting on um, the balance of two risks. You know, one risk is that we commit to a project too early when we don't have adequate detail. Um, that can lead to, to challenges down the road. I think another risk can come when we, you know, go so far down a design uh, process and then, then choose to shelve that. I think, um, I think looking to understand, first of all, so this motion is really uh, intended to answering a specific question, which is, you know, do we, do we get the certainty that we need at checkpoint three around final project costs? Um, I think if the answer is yes, then, you know, I, I think that reaffirms the approach that we're taking. I think if it comes back that there is there is more variability, um, then there's, you know, an opportunity to look at, again, maybe it still is an earlier, you know, it still could be called checkpoint three, but we're looking at different approaches uh, like um, uh, early contractor involvement, other ways to, again, reap the benefits of having cost certainty without 
overspending on designs that potentially don't move forward. In addition to cost, am I dying seconds? Uh, you know, I think this is also an important practice when it comes to community expectations. And when we're funding design work, ensuring that, um, again, if it, that raises community expectations, that we are have some line of sight to the delivery of that project in the end. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Councillor Prince Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so, I am aware that council requests quite a few reports to be made by administration, which which takes a lot of work. Um, I just want to know uh, to the mover: Do you feel that you actually need this information? Because I think we are aware of of the information that you're looking for. Like, do, do you need to see, do you need an, an analysis to be certain? I, I'm not sure like what the purpose of the analysis is. Sometimes some of the reports that we request don't lead to any actions. And I'm not sure if this report is necessary. Sure, no, I appreciate the question and, you know, happy happy to turn to administration if they feel that, that there is a source for this information that, that already exists. I think where I struggle is that we, we do get quite frequent reporting on alignment with um, approved budget, but as, as we all know that, that um, you know, we, we, we make amendments to the, the budget approval, so that's, that's a frequent process. And I, you know, I honestly don't don't have that line of sight from the checkpoint three point to our final project costs. Um, again, we see great alignment with with projects being on time and on budget, um, and that budget is the approved budget, which can change over the course of a project. I'm interested in understanding when we go from that baseline of our checkpoint three, um, where where are we ending up? But happy for administration to chime in again if if you feel this information uh, is available elsewhere. Yeah, no, I think um, I'm, I'm okay with this motion. It's a little bit more of a meta multi-year analysis and looking at our data in a different way. So we know the data is there and putting it from 2019 was intentional because that's when we set our current path of how we're doing this and reporting. So that contains the amount of data. So this is reasonable from that context and it'll just give a little bit different lens to how we're doing. So we're okay with it from that perspective. Okay. Okay, yes, and I was going to go to administration next to ask them that as well. And um, also I wanted to ask what exactly, what type of analysis were you looking for? Because an analysis can be quite in depth. So I wasn't sure how far DP wanted to it to be analyzed. Um, but uh, uh, apparently that administration sees that this is work that is uh, maybe not too, too time uh, too much of a time restraint. So, okay, thank you. That's my only question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I actually want to pick up on Councillor Principe's line of questioning uh, to administration. You said that this would give you different analysis, but I'm thinking back to the recent capital reports that we've had where we've already given that feedback. And at the last one that I saw, I was really impressed to see both the approved and the original budget in that table. So what, what new information do you understand that we are going to get from this? Yeah, I would say a, a lot of those are quarterly reporting and our updates we do, and we do try to give a baseline and a reference. So the pieces. Yeah. So you, you, pieces, you have you have you have outlined in those recently, especially right. any changes in the approved budget. Yeah, that's that's fair, Councillor. The pieces are all there. This would be a different aggregation and compiling it in a different way and presenting it a different way. I guess is how I see it. Okay, but like, is there actually like? Because one of my things that I I, I like I I I think we're using emotions a lot when things can be an inquiry. Like I I just. I don't understand if we, this information is readily available and we're just going to format it differently. Are we actually doing any analysis? Like what is the analysis that administration is anticipating doing on this? The analysis. What is the new work? What is the new work that is being generated from this motion? It would just be pulling the data in a different way on, on the costing of our projects from checkpoint three to final cost and completion of our projects. If that answers the question. Yeah. So I guess to the city clerk, is that not an inquiry? 
I think administration would have to make a determination if the information available could be provided via memo, but if it does require more in-depth analysis of resources, it would usually come back as a report. Yeah, I bet we have inquiries that come back as reports too. Do we not, clerk? Correct, most inquiries would come back as a report. Yeah, so. As a memo. But the, what's the, can you, can you shore up the difference between, can you, can you outline the difference between a motion? Like what's the intent of an inquiry versus a formal inquiry versus a motion? A counselor inquiry in many senses is a motion. It does not necessarily have to be related to a specific item on an agenda, um, but it can be asking for information of various scopes. So it's passed as a motion in most cases. It can specify if a report or a memo comes back and then it's up to administration to determine um, the amount of work that's required to produce a report versus a memo. I'm sorry, that, that answer was very confusing. So why do we even have inquiries on our, on, on, on our agendas then? if we do all our inquiries as motions, is what I understood that. And if I didn't understand that correctly, please correct me. Yeah, the reason we have a specific section for counselor inquiries, again, is because the counselor inquiry itself can be a motion that does not have to relate specifically to an item on an agenda. But we don't vote on inquiry, we don't vote, we don't vote on inquiries because they don't generate new work. It is, it is there's specific parameters around inquiries in terms of generating already existing information. No. Yeah, counter a motion Tondre, generates new yeah, work. Yeah, counter to Andre, I, I think what you're getting at, for me, the big difference is a report usually requires new work to be done. An inquiry should be about collecting information that doesn't, that exists already that we don't have to do analysis on, so. And so I guess I'm still, I'm still very confused with this motion and I'm trying to get a scope and scale and sense of what is the analysis, what is the scale of work that is being asked of this motion? Because again, we just had a great report that highlighted that the PDDM model is really great. We have a lot of other things. We have another motion that we just passed around that I think is, is really uh, digging deep into an area that has been problematic. And I'm just conscious of the, the amount of work we're asking of administration on so many things. So I'm just trying to get a sense um, of what is the scope and scale of this ask and in, in the accumulation of all of the other motions that we are making. No, that's to administration. Okay, sorry, thanks, Councillor. I don't think it is, I, I think this could be a memo if that's amenable to, um, to the, the intended, um, the intent of this, I don't think it's a lot of, it's just processing data we have, so. So to the mover, are you amenable to a uh, memo as opposed to a report? So, you know, I think a memo can be helpful because it gives us information, but then if information uh, leads to further action being required, then that requires a notice of motion compared to a subsequent motion for something that's already on the agenda. Okay, I'm out of time. I'll just speak to it when the time comes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sophie. I want to follow up with Councillor Rutherford's question and her question and also uh, brought the two points I'm concerned about. Um, I want to ask movers if, because the first confu uh, confusing uh, in the my mo uh, in this motion is about uh, we want all the projects completed since 2019. So no matter it's checking point three or checking point five. So that's his first request. And the second request in the motion is to talk about uh, the budget estimates and, and check point three to find a project. Is that understanding correct? I want to clarify because I'm a little bit confusing. So you, there are two asking in this motion. No, and I think, um... You know, this was this was some wording that that we had gone back and forth with. Um, it is not a two part ask. The specific analysis I'm looking for is a comparison of the budget estimates that are provided at checkpoint three versus the final project costs. So you are only looking for the information for the checkpoint point three since 2019 and to the final project cost and for the project is not project completed since 2019. Correct. This is so any, any projects. Sure, yeah, any projects 
that started in 2019 or maybe had a checkpoint three budget estimate in 2019 and are not yet complete, they wouldn't have a final project cost. So I don't think would be included. I wouldn't anticipate them to be included in this analysis. Uh, so then I have two, two comments on, on this. The first one and for the capital budget and since 2021, the capital budget 2022, 2023, and we already have the very detailed list and analysis and for the project since 2019, like even like more than 2019 and for the la last budget cycle and the information there and by following this PDDM. So that information is already very clear in the budget documents. Uh, so I'm a little bit confused why we need that information. Unless you want to look at for certain projects, we want to reverse the decision, we want to change or cancel the project. So what's the purpose for the information use? So this is my first question. So the next question, if this is information is already there, and yeah, I agree with Councillor Rutherford. Can we have some, just the MIMO and instead of the report come back for the further discussion? Because this is something I, I still try to, I'm still struggling. Sure, yeah, I mean, I I certainly am happy to, to, um... To hear from colleagues, I'm I'm not hearing any concerns from the part of administration in terms of preparing this work, but if there is comfort in in receiving this as a memo rather than a report, you know that's that's fine. Um, again, I don't know that it's it's as efficient. I find that you know sometimes with memos, uh, I because they're not on an agenda, um, uh, there isn't. I personally. When there is something on an agenda, I prepare for it in a timely way. Sometimes with memos, those can become, you know, uh, something that doesn't get the same amount of attention as a report. But if there's comfort for my colleagues to receive it that way, happy, happy to consider that. Uh, so then for the intention piece, uh, what is specific, how would you like to use this information? Do you want... Uh, is there any potential intention there to revise some decision already made uh, in the last budget cycle for the capital project? Oh. Or what's the intention? So I didn't see the significant outcome <clears throat> or follow-up action needed and for this, based on this information already exists. Yeah, so what I've heard from... You have different potential um, uh, goal and you're looking for uh, use this information. Yeah, so I think what I've heard from administration is that there, this information is currently not in a format that uh, we can we can access. They have this information, but it hasn't necessarily been packaged in this way. Um, in terms of what it could inform, it's not at all about any specific project. It's about, uh, again, that continuous improvement. I think for me, it's understanding council's role in the PDDM project uh, process and you know where we can make the most effective decisions. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the answer. Back to you, Mayor Sohi. Yeah, Councillor Rice, can you take the chair? I just have a quick question. Um, uh, I have the chair. Uh, this is to maybe to Andre or someone else in the, in, in the, in the team. In the 2021 capital budget adjustment, the Ambleside Yard decision, as well as the Terwilliger, sorry, not Terwilliger, Lewis Farm Rec Center decision was made at checkpoint three to go ahead and build them instead of going to checkpoint four, then coming back. That's, and, that's am, my am I right yes. in my understanding? That's my understanding as well. I think we made a decision because we knew that there's a community expectation we're going to build them anyways. Why not decide at checkpoint three instead of going to checkpoint four, then delaying it another whatever the delay, right? I, yeah, so, that's my understanding. So maybe maybe questions to Councillor uh, Stevenson: Is that kind of opportunity you're looking at? Whether we have enough budget certainty that instead of going to checkpoint four, we give approval to project at checkpoint three and eliminate a step? Yep. Okay. I think that this would be a good starting point for that, that discussion. Okay, got it. Okay, that's the word. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Rutherford to speak or questions? Uh, I'm actually on the board to move on an amendment, and I'll speak to, to okay. why. Okay, I, I please go ahead and move the amendment. 
to replace report with memo and delete the due date of May 23rd, 2024 executive committee. Um, sorry, can, uh, can you say that again? I missed it. To replace report with memo and okay. delete the okay. due date of May 23rd, 2024 executive committee. Got it. Okay. So it'll come as a memo. Uh, second. second by Councillor Rice. So we'll vote on the amendment. Sorry, can I? Sorry, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I know I, I sound like I'm splitting hairs here, but I, I really am. We are literally talking about OP12. We're literally trying to find money under every couch cushion. And I'm hearing the intent for information. And I get that it's sometimes easier to just do subsequence, but I also don't think subsequence are necessarily good governance because we get blindsided by them. And I think that when we think about staff time, we have to think about all of us on council, city clerk, and the team that has to come to that committee meeting to discuss that report. If we get the information and we think a discussion is further warranted, I think a notice of a mo of motion is actually the most appropriate format for that to happen. And I think we should be using it more regularly. So that is why, like, I know why I seem like I'm making a, a mountain out of a molehill, but I think we need to really be more judicious in our use of resources for some of these discussions. That is why I'm putting this forward. But I think the information is absolutely important and I would love to see that information as well. And it doesn't sound like informa uh, the administration has an issue with providing that information. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. So please vote on the amendment. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Well, that is carried unanimously. <laughs> okay, now we can vote on the balance of the the, the motion. Sorry, the, the motion as amended. Okay, please vote. Sorry, can we just clarify who the seconder is for this? Uh, Councillor uh, Salvador was seconder. Oh, so for the Councillor Rutherford's motion, that was Councillor Rice seconded it. For the motion as amended. That will, Councillor Stevenson moved it and Councillor Salvador seconded it. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Any other subsequence? Seeing none, so we have 130 time specific, right? And that's in camera? That's yeah. correct. Yeah, so I think instead of starting with OP12, we'll just take a break here and- uh, Can we move? Yeah, can we go in camera, please? Yeah, I can move, uh, we go in private. Okay. Second. Okay. Please vote. Um, I guess subject to the various sections. Thank you. 17, 19, 24. Okay. Okay. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. We'll be back at 1.30. Until then, we are on the recess.
committed done a And we are in public. Okay. We are back in public. Do I need to do roll call or? I think everyone is here. Okay. All right. So, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will move that attachment one of the January 23rd, 2024 Office of the City Clerk Report OCC 02271 be revised for the in private discussion. That the actions outlined in revised attachment one be approved and that uh, the aforementioned report remain private pursuant to section 17, 19, and 24 of the Freedom of Information and Protection of, Personal, of Privacy Act. Thank you. Need a seconder? Second. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Okay, please vote. Here it is. All right, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, so we concluded this item. And our next item was going back to OP12. Uh, and we were in camera on that Item. So can someone move that we go back in camera, please? So moved. Need a second. Second. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Please vote. Just give us one moment to get the vote loaded. I think I should be dropping off now. So it's thank Kevin. You, so yeah, thanks. Thanks thank everybody for your time care. and have a great weekend. Bye. Bye. Just waiting on one vote. Councillor Carmel. Councillor Paquette is a yes as well. Okay, thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, we'll give you a few minutes to bring back the delegation. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, we are public from council chambers. Okay. All right, so we are back in public. We are on our uh, 7.1 operating budget adjustment amendment 12 update. Uh, any more questions to administration on in the public? Councillor Rice, can you take the chair, please? Uh, I have chair. Okay. Just one question. I'm, and this is, again, I'm seeking clarity on uh, stream one review past work, right? So last two columns, 2023-2026 budget OB12 amendment. Uh, 15 million in 2023, 15 million in 2024. So 30 million dollar has been already cut from the budget, right? Yes, that's the amount that we removed as part of the original motion. And as part of original motion, another another 30 million is required for 25, 26, right? So that's how we come to 60, right? That's correct. And then I go down bottom known pressures, unbudgeted, $23 million, 2023, $26 million in 2024, total 49. That's another further reduction, right, on top of 60. So it basically the organization, or the, the departments were asked to manage those pressures without getting any additional funding. So yep. they're seeing cost escalation, but they didn't get any budget to cover that. Got it. So the way, is it, then if I'm reading it as 60 million plus $49 million reductions in the, in the base budget. Am I reading it right then? Correct. Okay, got it. That's all I needed. No, I, I think that's very important clarity that we, when we pass, because I'm, I'm reflecting quite a bit on this, maybe this to Andre, when we gave approval to OP12, my expectation was that we would reduce budget by 60 over four years and $240 million for allocation. But I'm already seeing that additional $49 million has been reduced from the budget on a permanent basis to meet unexpected pressures. Yes, correct. Okay, got it, okay. Thanks, that's gonna give me more things to, a little bit more to reflect on that as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much. Maybe uh, just a, a quick question in terms of our, our process moving forward. So, um, you know, the report references coming back in on March 12th, 13th. Just wanted to, to clarify, you know, I think I think there's been a lot of value in, in the conversations that we've had over the past couple of days um, and, and throughout the entire OP12 process. I think looking for as much common ground as possible, finding finding consensus on some items has been really great. But just from my understanding, you know, the decisions we're going to be making uh, in March, you know, we are, that is going to be based on the will of the majority of council, even if it's not uh, all members of council. Is that correct? That's really my understanding, Councillor. Yeah. Okay. So again, sort of seeking to find that, but but ultimately we are, you know, um, we are going to be casting casting votes on on these items in one form or another, depending on what what comes forward. Yeah, correct. And what we what we are going to try to do over the co the coming weeks is, uh, as we have meetings with councillors, we'll try to understand what different perspectives mm -hmm. councillors have, and look for some similarities and some concurrence that we could then potentially put into a, a draft omnibus for consideration uh, in mid-March. Great, great. So trying to catch as much of that, that common ground or whether there's sort of a larger uh, larger consensus in an omnibus, but again, some other items may need to be sort of point by point uh, that we're doing on a majority basis. Absolutely, you'll have the choice of either considering an omnibus or just doing it point by point or doing both. Great, great. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thanks again for the work on this. All right, any more questions? I see none. So this is to re receive for information. We have a motion on the floor. Anyone to speak? Councillor Rice, can you take the chair just? Uh, 
I have a chair. Thank you. Just a quick thank you to administration. Uh, this has been a lot of work, right? Thank you so much for uh, undertaking this work. Uh, this, uh, you know, will be more discussion on this in the coming coming weeks. Uh, but this has this is very valuable information uh, for uh, for for uh, that you have presented to. Uh, to council, and uh, I, I think this is very valuable information as from a communications point of view as well to the public and the value they get for uh, the taxes that the, they pay and the, the services uh, that they receive. So thank you so much to everyone for working hard on on this. And I know it, these kind of exercises do create anxiety, and I acknowledge that and I appreciate that. So we'll get to uh, hopefully through this process uh, uh, sooner, right? And uh, yeah, so with that, we deeply appreciate all the work that everyone has done. Yeah. With that, I will take the chair back. So, Mayor Sohei, I'm going to move this as uh, information received. We haven't put motion on the floor. Second. Thank you. I thank you for reminding me that, Councilor uh, Rice. I thought we had a motion on the floor. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, okay, and Councilor Paquette seconded it, right? Okay. Okay, uh, so Councillor Rice, you want to close? Uh, no, I know you said the very well, uh, everything, and then uh, okay. we're looking forward and to March 12th and okay. 13th and for okay. this uh, further uh, discussion. Okay, so please vote. In favor. Thank you, Councillor Jans. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Okay, that is carried. Uh, so, 7.1, 7.2, 3 was done, 7.4 was done, 7.5, 8. Uh, motions pending, uh, public engagement practice from Councillor Hamilton. This was laid over from January 30th, 31st, 2024 City Council meeting. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Yes, thank you. Um, I have some revised text. Um, I think the clerk will put it on the board. Um, I'll move that administration one for engagements that include community leagues as in their stakeholder contact list public engagement best practice is revised to recommend including homeowners associations as part of stakeholder and audience identification when appropriate and to provide an update to council by memo that confirms best practices for stakeholder contact lists for engagements including verification that contact information is current and monitored second Thank you. Um, the context of this is that um, as some members of uh, executive committee will remember, um, there was some policy changes that happened in December with respect to surplus school sites. And out of that discussion, um, I found out that the contact information for the community league wasn't current. Um, and uh, it, you know, it's hard for communities to feel, um, to come to those conversations in good faith if they feel that um, uh, for whatever reason, they've been missed as a key part of the conversation. So I think this is an opportunity for us to demonstrate um, our own best practices in terms of keeping community members properly engaged um, and, and consulted. Um, it's not going to be perfect, but I think that um, this is something that we can loop around uh, and, and just demonstrate some accountability on. And second of all, um, I know in some parts of the city, there are no homeowners associations. And in other parts of the city, there's a ton of homeowners associations. And uh, West Edmonton and Southwest Edmonton, I think even Southeast, has a lot of HOAs. Um, and they constitute 100% of a neighborhood sometimes. So I think that's, an again, another great opportunity to include all of the neighbors in a, in a conversation 
Um, and, and usually they have all the contact information, uh, so they can be great conduits, uh, for engaging community. Um, so I, um, I see this as sort of a simple amendment, but I'm open to questions from my colleagues uh, in, in terms of um, uh, how this might be implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. This, so this was a, a second by Councillor Paquette. Yeah, okay. Uh, any questions? I'm seeing none. So with that, Councillor Hamilton, you want to close? Uh, no, nothing to add. Thank you. Yeah, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Any notice of motions or motion without customary notice? Councillor Stevenson? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. At the March 12th uh, Council meeting, I will be making the following motion. The administration provide a report outlining tax forgiveness options for the outstanding tax balance for taxes assessed to Apadana Women's Housing Limited at 103350 Avenue Northwest, account 306-8400, as of April 30th, 2024. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see no other notice of motion or motion about customary notice, so we are adjourned at 3.15. Thank you, uh, Chris, to your team, everyone.